Engaging thrusters. All right. It says you are live. As you are live. <laughs> oh, we've already got oh. audio feedback. Oh, We're that's because of the stream. There we go. Oh, was that you? <laughs> okay, I thought it, I thought it was me. All right, we good? All right, we go. Yeah. All right, let's see. Can uh, can we get confirmation in the chat that you can hear both of us, gentlemen? Yeah. Well, I I was hearing both of us. Yeah. All right. So let's see what we got <laughs> going on here over in chat. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Okay. It looks like it's working. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Um, today we're uh, using the the dreaded Zoom technology for video and audio. We decided we'd give it a try because everybody's always complaining about the latency of Discord, causing us to talk all over each other. So this should allow us to be able to more quickly. Uh, uh, w w what's the word am I looking for? C communicado, conversate, conversate, yeah. and uh, so here, say something. I want to see something in Zooms. Go ahead and talk. I'm gonna talk a little bit. Uh about uh, some stuff today we're on the tech talk and we're that's doing... weird your uh your lips are actually out of sync with your audio what in, in zoom i wonder if that was because i disabled the hardware process or the hardware acceleration it's like doing some weird shit that's weird yeah whatever whatever this is the, these are teething pains when we change technologies yeah we'll um see. the reason the reason that we changed was uh discord discord was cool and all but the problem it had is just the latency was too high so we'd talk over each other because like it would be a full half a second before I'd hear auxiliary talk and vice versa. So it was really hard for us to know when to stop talking if somebody else started talking. So we figured we'd give this a try because I was on another stream uh, two weeks ago with Zoom on Bite My Bits. And I noticed that with three people in there, we never talked over each other. We could all just like dovetail right off the end of us speaking with like no problems. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah. See, so, and yeah. so like I, I hope I jumped in like right at the you end did. of that. It was, it was, it was in, yeah. imperceivably different from talking on the phone, which is nice. Right on. So, all right, I think I got everything all set up over here. Um, today, obviously, we're going to be talking about the Sony PS5 versus the Xbox Series X and Apple right. deciding to go with its its own chip. I mean, it's yeah. still ARM, but Apple's going with its own chip, and we'll talk about like uh, so, some of the implications that may come with that. Um, should, be, should be an interesting tech talk today. I actually woke up at 8 a.m. this morning. I'm quite proud of oh. myself. So, yeah. yeah, so I woke up at 8 a.m. I went for a walk with the family for all of about 15 minutes because I was so far behind schedule, hence why the show is late. <laughs> and uh, but uh, and I went to sleep at 3.30 a.m. So I've got next to no sleep. So I'm drinking. I got my liquid, my, my liquid courage right here and waking elixir. Same. I, I don't think I went to bed till like 2.30 myself. Oh, really? Yeah. I've been playing a game on my phone. I got caught up just spacing is, out. Is it Raid Shadow Legends? <laughs> no, no, it's actually uh, I think it's like based off of a board game. It's called uh, Ancient Terror. Ooh, Ooh, I haven't even heard of that. Is that, is that yeah. one of those free to play or? Yeah, it's got some ads and stuff, but um, yeah, it's definitely based on, I think it's some sort of Cthulhu mythos oh. board game. It's pretty cool. Once I, once I figured out like, you know, what it is I'm trying to do here and working on strategy and stuff. That's kind of cool. That's kind of yeah. cool. How is everybody doing this wonderful morning? Over there in chat. Oh, uh, Demi Houston said he's impressed that I went for a walk. It was the yeah. shortest walk ever, and I and I already like it hurt when I got <laughs> home. That's how out of shape I am from this whole COVID thing. I'm basically like spending my life in better in front of this computer. Oh my God, Jordan, my man! Thank you for those five pound Roonies, man. Five pound Roonies from our man Jordan said, Ooh. "Nerdgasm, you make great videos, dudes. Peace and love, my man. You know what? We need more peace and love." Yeah. In these times, we really do like peace and love and and handy J's and sensual massages. I mean, it's all good, but we need more of that, more of that and less war. I think I'm going to start classifying as a hippie. I mean, I know you already do just by how you look, you know, you got, bit, yeah. like like hi, hi, you got a little bit of the hipster vibe, like hipster lumberjack. That, that's what I would call if there's a category, it'd be hipster lumberjack. That, that's where I'd put you. And me, I don't know where I where I would belong in the spectrum. Like I don't know, nerdy fat guy is that is that an official genre these days? I'm sure there's probably like a category on the old uh, on the old P Hub. Yeah, you got the uh, you got the stereotypical like basement nerd. Basement nerd, that's what it is. Yeah, Dude. guy from, uh, from fucking uh, South Park, right? Like yeah, that. yeah. They, I got the Eric Cartman going on. Mom, bucket. <laughs> Hey, by the way, if you guys didn't notice, uh, Auxiliary over there is rocking a new microphone. Can you guys see that? That is an Audio Technica AT2050 because he's moved into the podcasting generation. Super fresh. I'm so yeah. I bet uh, yeah. I bet if you go back and listen to the other videos, this is so much better. Oh no, I can already tell. Like the second the second that we connected on the conversation, I was like, ooh, buttery man. Like there's some bass now. 
Yeah. Like like your other microphone was not doing it. It was a snowball, right? Your old one? Uh, the Yeti. The Yeti? Yeah. It did not even close. I honestly <laughs> thought that they were going to be closer than this. No, this sounds completely different. Uh, yeah, and, and big props to the mixer for uh, for the EQ, really, because like I'm, I have like the the highs and the bass boosted a little bit, and then I left the mids kind of just. Uh, which you know, which mixer did you end up getting? Uh, the Behringer Xenix Q802 USB. Ooh, fancy! So you got yourself a USB one too. Does it have sliders or knobs? Knobs. Oh man, it sucks. They don't do sliders very much anymore, unless it's on the Super Pro, the Pro level gear, and I love the sliders. Yeah, I, miss I, think, them. I think it's just space. Like, yeah. if you put sliders, the thing's got to be taller and, and wider because then the sliders have to be next to each other, whereas knobs, you can stack them. Oh, that's true. I never really thought about that. From a space efficiency perspective, it makes more sense to go with knobs than the sliders. But the sliders are just easier to manipulate with accuracy. Like, because you can, like, lay four fingers across the sliders and, like, manipulate, like, a whole spectrum of audio all with just one movement. Um, I've been thinking about getting the, uh, because of course, you know, my, my mixer boards on its last leg, finally, after all these years of abusing oh, it, really? um, yeah, I lost the channel that feeds my amp. So it, it oh, killed no. the channel in the mixer board. So I have no way. Well, I mean, I could put a Y on my, on my, uh, headphone and run it out there, but I don't, I, w- I don't want the headphones volume level going to my speakers cause it'll blow the amp up if I turn oh. it, if I leave it up. So yeah. I'm going to go ahead and swap that out. So I've, it's been a toss up between the go XLR and the road podcaster or whatever it is. There's two, there's oh, two right. of them. And they almost look and seem identical in their feature set. Like, it's crazy how close they are. Like, I thought GoXLR was, like, this new crazy thing that nothing else touched. But if you look at Rhodes product, it's actually very, very similar in what it offers. I don't think it has as much of the video side, though. Like, the GoXLR actually lets you control, like, OBS and the video compositing and all that stuff, too. So I haven't really decided which one I want to go with, but it'll be one or the other. Yeah. So Andrew said the Rode has much better preamps. Well, I'd expect that. I'd expect that from Rode. I mean, they make stuff like the NT1, which is a fantastic microphone. It isn't even like they they even make like really professional gear. Like they make they make stuff that you'd see like in recording studios and everything for like instruments. So I would expect that their product would have the better amplifiers in it. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, what are the two XLR cables you have, Mike? And oh, you mean over here? So, okay, so you're probably looking at my amp there in the background. So the first XLR, that's my mic. The second XLR on channel four right there is actually going to a computer that's under my desk right here. So my computer actually feeds in through that. So the fourth channel on there is the volume and the mix coming in from that computer sound card. So that because, and I don't really use it much anymore, but what I used to use it for is uh, I'd play my music, like my Spotify and everything. I'd have up on this screen in that computer. And then I tell uh-huh. it to play the music. And then what I could do is I could mix the music in by adjusting the volume on the two channels. So if I mm-hmm. wanted, if I was playing a video game, I could just have like a little bit of music in the background. Or if I was sure. doing something on the computer, I could just control it without having to go down and like mess with the audio sliders and play it on the main computer. And then the nice. other thing is while I was rebooting it, like when I'm reinstalling Windows and I'm setting stuff up, I could still have music always playing in the background while I'm doing all that stuff with uninterrupted. Um, but I haven't used it in a while. And I used to have three XLRs because I used to have another channel that ran to a third PC And that was my MIDI PC that had studio monitors on it. And then what I could do is I could play around on that and like, you know, compose my music back in the day. And then I could feed it through the mixer board back. And then on this computer, I could record it. So Mm. on this computer, I'd have like audacity up and it'd just be recording the raw output coming out of the sound card of that one. So I played around with all different kinds of things. But the truth is, I've never pushed this board anywhere near its limit. I mean, it's got 10 channels. Yeah. So so if I wanted to, I could connect like, you know, 10, I could connect like guitars and drum kits and external audio source. I could plug my cell phone into it. Like if I wanted to, like an adapter on the cell phone, it's just it, there's no need. Right. Yeah. Even even the mixer I have is a little bit overkill. Like, um, you know, it's got two XLR inputs and then what, four more. Wait, wait is it? No, it's it's two other like left and right inputs. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I have one, two, and then together is three, four, and five, and six are on the same. So I think that's two two channels a piece, really, left yep. and right. But, yeah, I just, yeah, it's, it's it, it was, like, maybe one step more than I really needed. Yep. But, uh, they make you know. a Bluetooth XLR adapter, too. It's, like, 50 bucks on Amazon that you can plug mm-hmm. into the XLR, and then you can pair any device to it. So, like, you could yeah. pair your phone to it, and it would be bi-directional audio over Bluetooth to your phone into the mixer board, and then you could adjust the audio to mix it in. Yeah. So, like, if like if we were doing, like, this, like, a show, and we wanted somebody to call in on a phone, I could yeah. literally answer it connected to Bluetooth via that, and then I could adjust their audio level with the knob on the mixer board instead of having to, like, fuck with it and add gain filters and stuff. So, oh, okay. so that's another thing that I never did that I wanted to do was add the Bluetooth support. 
Hey, a yeah. guy named Nathan. Thank you for the $4.99. He said, your vids are awesome. I know. I should make more of them again, huh? I really should. Yeah. Brian, mm-hmm. Brian, PC, PC. I like how he has PC in there twice, just, you know, to keep it at PC. <laughs> Thank you for the five pounds. He said, hi, guys. You're awesome. I love walking the dog. It saved my sanity in lockdown here in Scotland. Cycling. Cycling's cool, too. I just recently started riding my bike again, man. My e-bike. Yeah, right dude, on. I got a new one that's awesome. Like Ooh. the some dude sent it to me. He owns a company called e-bikes up in Canada. It's like e-bike CA or something like that. And he's okay. like, dude, let me send you an e-bike. Um, he's like, he's like, you don't have to do anything. I just want your opinion on it. Like, you don't even have to review it if you don't want to just like go. You know, I want your opinion on it. He sends it to me and I put it together and I take it out and I ride it. And I'm like, meh. I'm like, meh, because yeah. it's like a three thousand dollar <laughs> e-bike. And I'm like, the Rad Power Bike seems like it's it's just as good and it's like less trouble because with a mid-drive, this is a mid-drive bike, so you have to actually shift it and get the gear shifts right and everything. So it's using the gear on the bike. Well, the first time I tried it out, I was like, meh. So I put it away for a little while. Then I pulled it out again and I started messing around with it and I realized that I never kicked it into its high power mode. Oh. And so I took it out um, last week and I, and I find the power setting and I go all the way up to five. It goes up to five and I had it on one. So in one, it was like the rad power bike. It was only putting out about 500, 350 to 500 watts. All right. Then I put it in, in five, and the power meter just like pegs, like a, tur- like a turbo boost gauge, goes to 1,250 watts. And in first gear, it's geared super low. The thing like about pops a wheelie with my 350-pound ass on it. And I'm like, whoa. I'm like, okay, this is different. So I took the thing up the steepest hill in my town, which, I mean, it's, it's such a steep hill. That if it was like snowing or something like that, you'd have no way to even crawl up it on your hands and knees. That's how steep it is. And it took me up that hill at nine miles an hour with no pedaling. So my my other bike can't do that. Uh oh, we lost you. What? What do you mean you lost? That was me? weird. You were like talking there and there was no audio. Oh, that's weird. I wonder if oh. Zoom's doing that thing where it cuts you off if I'm talking. Weird click, I guess. Hold on, let me see if we can figure that out. So it might we, be some sort of ducking, yeah. Yeah, let me see. So audio, hold on here. Sync buttons, automatically join computer, use separate audio device for ringtones, test mic, output level. Here, say something while I'm talking. Blah, 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 blah. I'm going to keep talking. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it, it's ducking you. God damn it. How do I disable that feature? I hate it when it does that. Here, we're going to fix that. So mm-hmm. automatically join audio. No, that's not it. Let's see. Yeah, um, like it drops your audio level down. See, See if it's on your side, too. Just like look around for it. Spotlight my video when I speak. I don't see a setting for it anywhere. Enable denoise. Maybe somebody in chat would know. So does does anybody know like why why is it ducking the audio? Uh, let's because it's here. not doing it. It's not doing it in OBS. It's actually doing it in Zoom. So I'm si- like here, go go ahead and talk while I'm talking in OBS. Check 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 check. Yeah, see, it's not OBS. It's not OBS uh-huh. doing it. So we got to figure out what the hell's going on here with Zoom. Stand by, guys. Will we troubleshoot this problem? We're gonna fix it. All we are right. gonna fix it. There's got to be a way to fix it though, because this is bi-directional audio. This is and, and the thing is, is, it's ducking you. Like I can hear it. It's like an analog drop. Like it slowly drops you and then slowly brings you back in. I don't like that at all. Yeah, that's no good. So we're gonna that fix was the that. I had with the uh, voice meter and their noise gate. It didn't yeah. just cut it, you know, quickly. It like slowly like faded out. Mm-hmm. Let's see here. Move my microphone when joining a meeting. Automat- oh, there's an automatically adjust volume. Let me disable that. All oh, right, say something turn- now. Hello, mm-hmm. hello, hello, hello. I can turn my automatically adjust audio- volume off as well. Yeah, turn yours off. There. T- mm-hmm. Now now say something while I'm talking. Blah, 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 blah. Nope. It's still giving me priority, and I don't know why. Go in meeting option to enable original sound from microphone. Okay, and we're going to turn on original sound. Okay, so I went to uh, audio settings. Yes. So, and then under, I think it was advanced. Okay. There's a checkbox for show in meeting option to enable original sound from microphone. Correct. Got it. And then, and then it's going to show a button above the video and then click on that, I think. Okay, and there's also a suppress persistent background noise. I'm going to just go ahead and disable that. And I'm also going to disable the intermittent background noise. So I'm just going to turn all that shit off. Echo, echo cancellation. I'm just going to leave that, whatever. And now we turn on the original audio and see if that works. Yeah, I hope that works. Okay, so turn on original audio. There you go. Start talking. Check, 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 check. Nope. It's not, du- uh, like, from my point of view, you're not ducking. Yeah, it's still shitting all over you. That sucks. So select microphone to use for original sound. Your line. 
uh, let me find it. Where is it? Line four. There we go. MG10XU. Turn on original sound. Check, 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 check. Oh, and the mic on the mic. Make any mic. Hello. Are there any mics in the in the chat? That's weird. Why is it doing that? Hey guys, can we get some can we get some tech support over there in the chat for Tech Talk today? If you guys know anything about Zoom, could you tell us how to fix this problem where it's ducking audio? Make him a co-host to also have priority? Question mark. How do I do that? Let me see here. Oh, I can make you the host. Hey. Uh, let's see what else can we do here. If a mic, if a mic, mic or could mic, mic, mic. Here, what happens if I make you the host? Let's see if it reverses it. Hold on here. So let me make you the host. Okay. Are, okay. Do you want to change the host auxiliary? Yes. Look at me. I am the host now. All right. So now you're the host. Go ahead and talk while I'm talking. Check, 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 check. check. Nope. Still shitting all over you. Bless America. I don't know why it's doing that. Here, mute my audio, stop video, rename, pin video, self-hide video. Don't use Zoom. Well, I know. come on, MindPod, I know. Everybody tells me not to use Zoom, but we had to try something. You did. Make him a co-host to also have priority. I don't know. What, like, where, where do you set it to co-host? Is that just like, is, is that a setting somewhere that I'm not seeing? Wow. We're going to figure this out, though. We're going to use our, we're going to use the power of tech support yeah, to are, get this all figured are. out for us. Again? Well, let's see. Anyway, uh, let's see here. K and L with fuck Skype. You blow load. <laughs> Teams? No, no, we're not switching the team. We're not changing the technology for the show. We're using <laughs> Zoom for the show. Uh, but I'm just wondering, like, where do you where do you do the co-host thing? Oh, disable audio processing from Mister Tex as. Okay, let us see this thing. Launch the Zoom desktop client on either you, Mac, or PC. After launching the application, select settings audio. Select your device for both the microphone and the speaker selections. Deselect automatically adjust microphone. Yep, done that. Did that. Select allow option for using original sound from microphone in meeting. If this option is unavailable, continue below to advanced settings for additional instructions. <sighs> when in a meeting, select the drop down menu next to turn on original sound. Select your device listed as the, the microphone. From this point forward, Zoom will always use the original sound from the, in this case, Phoenix device. And so. And we did that. I have, I have selected my microphone, at least. And I did on my side, too. So, yeah. So I think we've done. Yeah, you guys are amateur. Well, I appreciate your in helpful <laughs> input. I just, I don't know why this isn't just an option. You can just like, I mean, I disabled everything. Show in meeting option to enable original sound. I got that enabled. Audio processing. I have disabled, disabled echo cancellation auto. And then under turn on original sound, I have the sound device selected. And okay, let's try that. Test, oh, test. Now your AC. Is it working better now? I hear your AC now. Oh, so it is getting around the audio processing now. That's fun. But it's still ducking you for some reason. Because, and I don't get it because you're, I made you the host. Like, you're literally no, the host right now. So back host powers. Because I'm a nice guy like that. Oh, did you give me back my host powers? It doesn't even say anything. Like, I don't even know if it is. Stop video, rename, pin video. Let's see here. Security, record, reaction, screen share. I mean, I think we've done everything we can. Is it possible that OBS is the one doing this? Is, is that maybe possible? No. No. OBS doesn't have any sort of... It audio ducking. Yeah, I wouldn't duck the desktop audio, right? No. All right. Well, I'll not just aware of. I'll just try my best not to talk over you. <laughs> that's what I'll do. No, Which I is know. even harder because that's the whole reason why we didn't want to do this. All right. Shit. Uh -oh. yeah, I don't have a. I don't have a noise gate anymore. Um, there's a compressor built into the mic, but that's not going to make me any quieter. Or, or it's not. It's it's definitely on Jerry's side if I'm ducking. It is. Um. That's what I was wondering if it was if it was because uh, I'm using Streamlabs OBS, which I need to get away from, by the way. But uh, yeah. it's it's the de you're on the desktop audio channel and then I'm captured as a microphone. So but when I right. talk, it ducks down the desktop audio. But I don't know if it's OBS doing it or if it's, in fact, uh, Zoom. I don't really know. Let me check and see if there's wonder, a filter on desktop audio. I wonder if it's a Windows thing. If you're using your direct mic uh input windows might be ducking the audio from uh zoom um <gasps> oh you're right um fuck, where where is it that's a, that's like a windows setting right yeah i think it's like in the properties of the microphone um i think you're right let me go see if i can take exclusive control of this device or something along those lines yeah let me find it i know i know exactly what you're talking about it's like uh let's see under sound control panel 
Input device properties. Advanced sound options. Hold on. God, I'm trying to find... It's always like pulling teeth trying to find the old menu system that actually gives you access to all that crap. Here, sound control panel. Is that it? Yes! Okay, I found it. Okay, sound control panel. I'm going to go into line MG10XU, which is my... Okay, so... Levels advanced. Okay, give exclusive mode application priority. Allow applications to make exclusive control of this device. Um, listen to the... Okay, continue and running on battery power. I don't see the quiet things down while you're talking option. You've mastered the, the secret art of moving so slow as to become invisible. <laughs> <laughs> I do I do recall there being an option though. I think you're right. There is an option somewhere where it's like it automatically drops the system audio when you talk. Yeah. Uh let's see. Windows audio ducking. And I'm trying to find that shit. Like actually is it under the playback device maybe? Hold on. I think I just locked up my oh, automatic Windows 7 8 10 audio button. Okay, let me see if it's under here. Uh, Levels. To, let's see. It has yep. nothing to do with communication settings. Uh, blah, blah, blah. It was a built-in audio ducking feature. It was very annoying. Two or more audio sources are playing. The maximum mm -hmm. audio. Well, I checked the playback device, and it doesn't have any such setting. Uh, Right-click. It says right uh, for Windows 7, at least. Let's see. I don't have that tab. Previous Windows. Um, or at least, okay, it's so a Windows 7 solution. Um. Right click your volume control, click playback devices, right click on your speakers, choose enhancements, check loudness. Mm, let me see. Uh, oh, let's see. If you're experiencing sound volume reduction when OBS is open to tie, checking the disable Windows audio ducking option in settings advanced in OBS. Then restart OBS to see if. The oh, shit. It says you got to restart it. Mm. Well, hopefully, OBS Studio, you don't have to restart it. Let's see. Okay, so what was it under audio? Uh, yeah, settings, advanced, and then disable. Okay, so audio. So settings. I don't see an advanced. I see under, okay, so under OBS Studio. Oh, wait, there's two advanced. Here we go. Advanced video audio. There it is. Okay, disable Windows audio ducking. Boom. I'm going to hit that. And then I'm going to change it to MG10XU. I'm going to hit done. Okay, now talk. Okay, I'm Testing, talk. testing, testing, talk. testing, testing. Yeah, I'm not quiet. Testing, testing. It still it still ducks you, but I I think that was the option. Okay. I'm sure you already What's know, but you're frozen. Oh wait, I'm frozen. Look at your yeah. screen; you haven't moved. Oh, is that what is that what auxiliary was making fun of me earlier? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, babe. <laughs> Hold on, I I got I gotta make I gotta make my camera work again now. All right. Well, at least now we know. Next time I reset, next time I reset, it will be okay. Uh, here, so here, this might be it. Um, go into your audio devices. Okay, right. hold, hold on. Let me see if I can get my camera working here again really quick. I got to go into... Wait a second. So, in Zoom, now turn my camera back on. Come on now. Come on. Oh, oh, oh. There I am. Okay, now what do I got to do? Uh, so, under the, the audio settings where you have, like, the tabs that for playback recording, right? Playback recording in OBS, you mean? No, no, no. Your Windows audio settings. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Let me go back in there. I just had it open. Devices. Welcome to troubleshooting. We tell... We tell he this whole time. <laughs> All right, I'm in. The, okay, so I'm in the. Yeah, there we go. Playback, recording, sounds, communications. Yeah. Okay, so under communications, ah, uh, Windows detects communications activity. Uh, do nothing, perhaps. Got it. Got it. It's right now. It's on reduce the volume of the other sounds by eighty percent. There we go. Do nothing. Apply. Hit OK. Do nothing. Windows. Now, let talk. Talk while I'm talking. Talk. 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 Nope. Still talk. shitting all over you. Ducking. No, no, I'm on my ranting face. Oh, well. We're just going to live with it. I'm oh, fine. I'm just going to be quiet. We're You're just going to live with it. voice, Jerry. I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm suppressing you, man. I, I am the suppressor of the people. I apologize. Well, the good news is I think we found like three places where the audio ducking was justified and we disabled it all. So now we have to disable OBS. We have to disable. Okay, we disable. I basically have to reboot the computer and restart yep. OBS and then everything should work next time. Now, now we can't even hear you at all. Jerry just loves to shit of people. Did you mean on? Are we getting some asthma right now? Stream now. Sorry, we'll just it, 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 we'll just take turns on who gets the talk. 
I'll, t- I'll tell you what, you guys, you guys just do a super chat and say who gets to talk, and then each super chat, just put in the name of who gets to talk, and then we'll just go back and forth throughout the entire show. The raise hand option in Zoom. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> should, should we do that just when you want to talk? Just go like this, and then the other person just stops talking? Oh, my God. We live in a world of technology. We don't know what the fuck we're doing. <laughs> this is so bad. Oh, I am sorry, guys. I am sorry. This is just the way it is. We actually have 394 people watching this shit show right now. Wow. This is this is slightly embarrassing. Um, <laughs> yeah, because you th- well, I mean, it's we did literally try out a brand new technology last minute. We didn't even test it out really beforehand, uh, which is like you know carnal sin. You shouldn't. We shouldn't have been doing that. But yeah. I think we figured out what the Windows, the Windows approach. We're testing in production. Exactly right. This this what this is how Microsoft does Windows update, guys. We're giving we're actually giving you. There's a hidden lesson behind all of this. The interesting thing is you're absolutely right. Under communications, it that was the thing. It said automatically have your computer adjust the volume down by 80%, which is exactly what it's doing, and you're on the system channel. Right. So because you're on the system channel, it would duck you. So I disabled it, but the problem is even though it's disabled, I think because OBS has already like initialized it. Again. Huh? You froze again. What? God damn it. <laughs> why why am I freezing? This is this is new. Uh okay. So wait, can I, here, let me just say, revert, no, mute all other sounds? No, I don't want to do that either. Okay, I'm just going to leave that shit alone. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to disable all these other devices that don't need to be on. Let me disable, I've got like a fucking thousand virtual devices here. What's that? Everybody, uh, some people are saying you got to restart your, your computer. Dude, I can't, I don't, oh wait, I'm back. It just magically started working again. I didn't even do anything. Okay, this is weird, man. This is weird. So, okay. This is, it, it is what it is, apparently. Yeah, that's Sh- fine. Should I enable spatial sound? Like, what the fuck spatial sound? Well, then, then it'll sound like I'm sneaking up on you. Yeah, screw that. We don't need that. All right. Well, today's first topic, I'll just add it to the topic later. T- today's first topic, guys, is how to, how to troubleshoot <laughs> problems. Audio ducking in Zoom. <laughs> Dude, well, why is there 75 fucking places where this stuff happens? So, okay. Communications under Windows 10 has an audio ducking option that's on by default. So we figured that's probably the one that was causing all the problems. Then there's there's one in Zoom that you have to adjust to. There's right. there's there's one you can do in OBS Studio. You can actually go in and disable Windows audio ducking, which I'm guessing is supposed to go disable the Windows 10 setting, which it didn't, probably because you have to restart OBS for it to do it. Yeah. Um, there's like three places where you have to do this. It's like, how, how, do, how does anybody figure this shit out? Honestly, I worked on Windows for like 15 years, and I still don't even understand what Microsoft's trying to achieve here. This is so weird. Pat just says I need a new computer. Uh huh. Is that will that solve my problems? Uh, probably not. You you fiddle around too much. I do. I do. I make I make John nervous <laughs> on Twitter every time. I'm like, oh, dude, it's so funny. Like everyone, I used to tweet like I'm gonna update my BIOS because both times I updated my BIOS, I like horked my computer really bad and had to get all the screenshots of the BIOS and everything to get the RAID working again. And uh, so now every once in a while I'll post I'm gonna, a time for a BIOS update. I think I should, you know what, I'm going to do that right now. Fuck, this, thing, this, this whole thing is a shit show today anyway, so I'm just going to go to Twitter. If you guys aren't following me on Twitter, follow at Barnacles on Twitter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to just say, I think today I'm going to update the BIOS on Houston PC. What do you think, Pu- Puget Systems? Good idea? Wink? All right, there we go. Little troll. By the way, are you, are you the, uh, do you run the Puget Systems Twitter? You do. I figured. So I figured the reply was going to come to you. But does anybody else monitor it? Is it just you? Yeah. No. No. They do. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Because I want. Because I, I. I specifically want John to see that. <laughs> uh oh. What happened? Your followers on Discord are upset. No tweet to indicate your stream has started. Oh, because we don't. Oh shit! I don't have a thing over there to say when we're streaming on uh, YouTube. Man, this is a shit show. We don't know what our Discord. Dude, if you guys ever want an example of like how not to be successful live streamers like just 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 look at us just look at us here let me just put on their youtube barnacles one there we go okay well that was that was late but i told him yeah did it it doesn't send out notifications does it? i don't even think it sent out notifications to twitter either does anybody on twitter know that we're streaming right now well sure we tweeted that it was happening oh well, i'll just i'll just tweet it again whatever they don't care uh, and i'll say total shit yeah. show yep. Well, the Zoom stuff was legit in the beginning because it was basically a matter of bad default settings or, or inappropriate default settings. Yeah. Like anybody with a link could just join into the meeting and stuff when by default it shouldn't, it shouldn't 
be that way. And so they just went and changed the default settings. Like, yeah, I think after that, I mean, and then there's still other vulnerabilities. Sure. Like clicking on links, and stuff, but that's just bad Internet practices to begin with. Don't click on weird links. Yeah. Well, they, they fixed that one, too. That, that was another one that they actually did fix. Um, Adam had sent it to me and said that, you know, it was like a pretty bad problem. And I agreed with him. But after looking, it looks like the latest version, it was corrected. Yeah. So so no big deal. Right. It's but but yeah. Uh, I'm not, that's the thing is I don't want to crap all over a piece of software if it works well and a lot of people use it, but Zoom did, did screw the pooch when they were just like letting people just like, like by default, when you created a meeting, just anybody with a link could join it. Cause then you had people that were literally just entering in like every link possibility and just joining into random meetings and like, Oh my God, kill yourself. You know, like, did you see the guys that were like joining the classroom feeds? Oh yeah. Like, yeah, it, like you should all kill yourself. Ha ha lols. And the teacher's like, where did this student come from? You know, it's like, I, I can see that being a little disheartening, but now you need a password to get into a feed or you have to have the feed organizer actually accept you. So even if somebody got the link, like if I accidentally leaked the link, I, it'd pop up and tell me that somebody wants to join and I can deny him. So, so I feel yeah. like zoom's way more secure than it was in the beginning. But it's like one of those things, whenever a company does something that's horribly, horribly bad, you know, that tends to shine on them for a while, right? It's not like something they instantaneously recover from. Right. Kind, kind of like when Brave Browser got caught with their pants down trying to put their affiliate links in on everything. And they're like, oh, our bad. That was an accident. That was We accidentally put in a bug that made us tons of money and, and abused our affiliate links. There's no but, way. Yeah, people know. There's no way that was a bug, dude. Like, I, I, I did a little deep dive into that, and I'm like... Okay, let me give them the benefit of the doubt. And after looking through it, I'm like, there's no way they accidentally created that feature. And then they came out and they're like, oh, no, no, this was a feature we were planning on using, but you had to like enable it through settings. Yeah. Oh, sure. Sure, you were going to create this and people were going to go in and be like, I want to enable the setting that just makes Brave a bunch of money by illegally using their affiliate links. By the way, you're not supposed to use affiliate links that way. Right. Like the whole point of an affiliate link is that somebody sends you to that site, you know. Well isn't that a uh, doesn't that violate the uh, what is it the FTC demand that you have to um, like declare those sorts of things like you have to declare like oh by clicking on this link I could earn some money like you're supposed to yeah it have to be it have to be an ad or it would have to like literally be a link on the site basically saying this is our affiliate link by them just adding it onto a URL at random when you press enter that's not that's not copacetic like that. That's bad. And I think that's why they're able to kind of get away with saying, oh, it was a bug. It wasn't intentional. But here's the thing. They weren't the ones that found it themselves. And I find that really hard to believe, considering they have all the data on the telemetry and all their money is made through like affiliate links and their cryptocurrency thing. So obviously they'd see this huge, massive uptick and they'd be like, oh, yeah. why are we getting like 100,000 times more the affiliate links now? Right. That doesn't make any sense. So. Ah, it's just it's just frustrating. So people people got really mad at me, by the way, for doing that, for calling it out. Oh, my God. I had the brave mafia come after me. That's nuts. Dude, they were ready to like put a horse head in my bed. I could not believe that like the brave mafia is that hardcore. Like, but I figured out why. The reason they're that hardcore is because they have an affiliate link system where you get brave coin or, or BAT or whatever they call it. You get this bat coin every time you get somebody to use your affiliate link to install the brave browser. So nice. all the people that are like, and, and you can make some serious money. I saw some dude that had like next to no following on YouTube and he made like $140 in like three months, like just getting people to install brave. Um, huh. So I was like, oh, okay, so this is real. This, this, huh. this, this is the real deal. So anytime you fuck with somebody's money, they're going to be mad. Right. Right. So as soon as I called out brave, they're like, uh, uh-uh, no, you didn't. <laughs> but, but at the same time, I decided to dig into it and I was like, and you know what prompted me to actually dig into Brave is everybody's like, man, you got to run this Brave. It's like the best browser ever in the entire world. And it's so good with privacy and all this. I'm like, dude, it's just another browser that runs Chromium that has different default settings. Like it runs sure. Chromium. You can open up Chrome and go into advance and disable scripting, disable uh, pop ups. Dis you can do all the privacy tracking, the trackers, the cookies. You can disable all that stuff in advance under the Chromium browser, under any Chromium browser, Edge. Or Chrome, it's just the default options in Brave is to have all that stuff disabled, right? You have to go proactively enable it if you want it. Um, so do I really give it like huge points for being like some new innovative thing? No, not really. It's just it's a different configuration out of the gate. But my God, you install it and there's two pop ups during install. They're like, hey, man, you want to make you want to make these crypto coins? Well, you're my, well, you're looking. The oh, do you want to watch our advertisements that'll give you like some crypt some of our cryptocurrency that we completely control and created ourselves? Like, I'm like, dude, come on. Like if the browser is hassling me that hard just to install the browser. 
then yeah. I'm not I'm not interested. And then, then then even though you deny it all, you close it all, it still pops up and tells you like how much BAT you have, just to remind you, even though you didn't sign up, that you're not making any BAT. And there's another little shield in the in the URL bar that every once in a while is like shimmering and looking at you funny. So that you'll click on it and be like, have you signed up to our ad program to where you can get BAT for watching our ads instead of the ads on the sites that we remove? I'm like, dude, does that really make you a good browser if you're removing ads on a site and then basically just shilling your own ads in their place so that you take all the revenue stream away from those content creators? Like, dude, it's one thing to have an ad blocker. I get it. If you don't like ads, install an ad blocker. All you're doing is blocking the ads. But when you're blocking the ads to replace them with ads that pay you instead, yeah, that's, that's a little fucked up. That's like, I start looking at that as a little bit of like reverse piracy. <laughs> so, so I was like, my God. Hey, Pat Carrillo, he said, hey, Jerry, what's the difference between a hacker and a script kitty? Oh, that is the easiest thing ever. I even did a video on that. Would you, would you, would you like to take a stab at that one? Well, I mean, the hackers actually know what they're doing. Script kitty is just copy paste, essentially. Or, or use pre, uh, pre-packaged, like, um, like back in the day, Sub 7. You remember that? Yep. <laughs> you'd, have to, you'd almost have to like trick your buddy into installing it so that you could like take control of his computer. That kind of thing. That's yeah. script stuff. You didn't actually do that yourself real hacker knows what they're doing and is exactly you know. exactly i mean you, you you hit the head on the nail i mean literally what i was going to say is the difference between a hacker. i wasn't even going to go that deep i was going to say the hacker between the script kitty and a hacker is that the hacker understands what he's doing the script kitty is just running what the hacker created yeah so so if you're a script kitty you don't understand what a ddos attack is you're just like oh i'm running this script and it's making this dude's modem slow down you don't understand the mechanics that you're sending icmp and sin flood packets and those are jamming up the router and fucking up how fast it can transact stuff back and forth thereby jamming up their connection and every other connection that's connected to that same router um there's script kitties that used to do like the out of band attacks you remember the person that made the pearl script that you could just hit port 139 on a windows xp box and just tank it (laughs) Like, that was script kitty stuff, right? Nobody knew how to know how the script worked. You just downloaded it, you pointed an IP address, you hit enter, and the person's screen turned blue and their computer rebooted. <laughs> and, 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 and so, yeah, that's the difference is that the hacker is the person that figured out the exploit, understands the exploit, and created the actual script or exploit. The script kitty is just the person that just searched the web for a way to be malicious, found a script, has no idea how it works other than how to double click on it and run it and maybe type in an IP address, if, if that much. You know, half of them don't even know what an IP address is. What is an IP address? Well, an IP address stands for your internet position, sir. It is broken up into a category of four numbers from 0 to 255 under the IPv4 standard. And under IPv6, it's exponentially larger. However, most things don't support IPv6. And he's gone. (laughs) 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 So so the funny thing is, like, they went through so much trouble to create the IPv6 standard because we were running out of IPv4 addresses. But then they just figured out how to do a bunch of segmented routing that just allows it to work with IPv4 anyways. So it's like most stuff on the internet that's routed via IPv6 still gets converted back into IPv4 at some point, whether it comes to you or not. It's like there's very few internet providers that support IPv6 right to your box. Yeah, I think a Comcast is one of them, though. I've, I've had more than a couple of people from Comcast report that you can actually get IPv6 through uh, uh, working through Comcast. I think, yeah, I think your external, uh, like your actual box, mm-hmm. I think is reporting an IPv6, but internally it's all four. Yeah, and and I can see Comcast needing that because right, their their user base is massive. Yeah, c- customers. Yeah, and it's like my my little podunk internet provider. They're not going to upgrade all their routers and stuff to like more expensive managed routers and shit. They're still probably using stuff from like the eighties. Yeah. <laughs> so and, and IPv4 has been around forever. Plus, that my other problem with IPv6 is it is like impossible to remember. Like IPv6 is oh, is I mean, absolutely so u- yeah, it's useless without I think DNS. Kind of crazy. It's I, I like I do the IP config and I see I see some. You know, it tells you, oh, this is your version six address. And it's <laughs> yeah. ridiculous. You can't just it looks like that. a freaking GUID or something. You know, yeah. it's like my what Mac a- address is, is my IP v six ad- address, you know? Yeah. Although their uh, their home, I think, is shorter than IPv4. So like one twenty seven zero zero one is home for IPv4. Right. But I think home for IPv6 is just three characters. I think it's like colon colon one or something like that. Wow. Can, some- can somebody in chat confirm what what is home for IPv6? I know it's super short. But everything else is massively long. Right. Yeah, pretty much. That's it. Renee, Renee, pretty much. Your IPv6 address is something like really, really crazy. <laughs> like here, let me see. What, what is my IPv6 address? If I, well, the one I have, I'm sure, is, is a fake. It's a local host one. So let me see here. So Ethernet Adapter 2. Um, okay, so yeah, this is my internal IPv6. So FE80 colon colon 465 colon A518 colon A953 colon 6AF4 percent. Wow. Like, huh? 
Huh? <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm gonna write that one down. And that's just an internal one. I'm guessing that's probably the one Windows generated because my router doesn't even give an IPv6 address through DHCP. So I'm pretty yeah. sure it just like tossed in, you know, whatever, like like some rando shit. Um, but it's like, yeah, it's it. I, I can see why it's needed. IPv6 is needed for like the greater global web, like for routing across the entire planet when all the IPv4 addresses are taken. Right. But at the same time, it's like I don't know of too many people that use it. So, wait, it's like this for your tech support number. Zero one one eight nine 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 eight eight one nine nine. See, it's just it's too many numbers. Yeah, too many damn numbers. Okay, so for local, it's uh, colon colon one slash hundred and twenty eight. Okay, so that's so actually, I mean, that's not as short as I thought it was. Like, I for some reason I thought it was just colon colon one. I didn't even know you needed the slash one twenty eight. Oh, I guess you don't. Apparently, yeah, it is. It's just colon. It's just colon colon one. Interesting. What happens if I do that? I want to see if I can ping that locally. So if I just ping colon colon one, there you go. One ms reply. So it actually worked. Nice. So so colon colon one is literally the local loopback for IPv6. Interesting. You don't even have to put the slash one twenty eight. What happens if you put the slash one twenty eight though? Let me see. <clears throat> doesn't work. It doesn't like the slash one twenty eight. So it's just colon colon one. Oh, okay. For local loopback on IPv6. There you go. That's pretty sweet. We learned a thing today. Hey, Zam, sorry for, for the lateness on your super chat, but thank you for those two dollar ruse. He said, Jerry talks about Apple. Well, we're, we're going to talk about Apple. Like, do you want to talk about Apple? Uh, I mean, it's just rumor stuff right now. But well, they're, they were talking I, about. Uh, I like rumors. Ditching, uh, ditching Intel for their arm stuff. We'll see how that works out. I've been hearing that from quite a few different people, too, and in institutions. So it seems like it's a little bit more than a rumor, like something legitimately leaked. I could see it because, I mean, Apple's, you know, big dream is to be 100% proprietary. They don't want to have to rely on anybody else to get their their stuff. So right. why not? Like, you know? what are some of the be- what, are, what are some of the benefits you see with Apple going with ARM? Uh, benefits? I'm yeah. not sure, honestly. Um, I know there's been some really good, um, like scientific stuff around ARM that's, that's been good, but, um, honestly, I'm not really sure. I, I'm not real, uh, real knowledgeable on, on the, the difference and stuff. I know it's like a different sort of architecture, like CPU basic you know, architecture or whatever, but, um, you know, x86 versus ARM. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty. I'm pretty of, sure that ARM is a processing. RISC processor. Yeah, I've heard that tossed around. Yeah, so it is. So reduced instruction set, which means that it has to do a lot less lifting per cycle. So, sure. so in theory, you can. You're, they're much more efficient. So they use way less power for the amount of compute that they can do. Uh, because of that, the heat dissipation is less, so you can run with a lot more cores. So in theory, you could have like a 128 core ARM processor. That was super, okay. super power efficient, and you only utilize the cores when you needed them. Um, there's actually quite a few benefits to going with ARM. As a matter of fact, uh, I was telling you right before the stream that Microsoft tried to do this already. Right. So, so when they when Windows 8 dropped, uh, the biggest failure of Windows 8 is that they tried to get the damn thing to run on the lowest common denominator hardware in existence because they wanted sure. to create tablets that would have battery lives that would be like 10, 12, 15 hours. Nice. And okay. so they came out with the Microsoft Surface RT, which was basically a clone of the normal Surface tablet, but it, it ran the ARM version of Windows called Windows. It was Windows 10, uh, what do they call it? Windows 10 RT or okay. Windows 10. Anyways, they had a Windows 10 version that just ran on ARM. That was it. So the problem that they had with it is because it was ARM, it couldn't run x86 and x64 code. They didn't want to emulate it because the thing was too damn slow. Um, with emulation. So what they did is you could only run software that was based on .NET Core, which was the new .NET framework at the time, and it had to be in the Microsoft Store. There was no way for you to like install third-party apps or even like develop stuff outside of the Windows Store. So it never got a huge adoption. Like people just did not buy these things, even though they were cheap. Now the the good part about them is the battery life was pretty insane on them. I had a Surface RT, and I want to say that the nine to ten hour battery life was incredibly realistic. Like you could actually get that. And I also had a Surface Pro which was the uh, the X64 version. Yeah. And my God, did it drain the battery fast. Like you might be able sure. to watch like a movie, like two, maybe two, two and a half hours. So you That's got four cool. times. I mean, yeah. Because like cell phones, right? They're all based off of ARM. Correct. And like tablets and, you know, your more mobile devices are all ARM based CPU. So like, yeah, why not? Why not apply that sort of technology to your to your desktop? Exactly. So or at least laptops, like holy cow! Like, if you could get a if you could get a laptop with a, with battery life like that, it'd be insane. 
Yeah, no, ARM is way is is way more efficient. So it makes all the sense in the world to move to an ARM architecture. The reason that they haven't is because there's so much invested into X64. Like yeah. there isn't a huge benefit, really. Like the stuff that you can do on ARM, like you can do everything on ARM that you can do on an X64 processor, but it just requires that you you make your code and compile it in a different way. And some things are going to be faster and some things are going to be slower. But overall, you can achieve the same thing. The problem is nobody wants to rewrite their code for ARM. Sure. So because nobody wants to rewrite their code for ARM, it's like when you switch the architecture, you have to find a way to keep supporting the software that already exists. And the only way to do that with ARM is through emulation. And sure. emulating X64, which is a which has a massive instruction set on a processor that has a reduced instruction set, that means that it takes more cycles on the ARM processor to emulate the one instruction on the X64, vice versa, so you end up getting a much slower experience. So you need an ARM processor that's much faster and you need way more cores if it's a multi-threaded thing to achieve the same level of performance. I feel like though with with the way things have been going with- um, That's true, Jam iPad, iPad in particular, um, there I feel like Apple is positioned very well for that sort of software compatibility. They'll they are. Basically use all of their iPad versions of stuff. Yep. Um, and honestly it's just it just forces you to use you know at some point you'll use you'll have to use final cut pro because nothing else works you know no yeah. adobe's not going to put a bunch of effort into trying to make you know premiere work and then oh you know what are you going to do gpu acceleration on your arm stuff like they were already ham-fisted with that as it is so it's like yeah the, well, the, interest, the other interesting thing with ARM, though, is it's what, way better suited for working with a GPU than X64 architecture. Oh. So, so like, oh. for instance, because, because the GPU does so much heavy lifting with floating point, and floating point is actually one of the strengths of 64-bit of, uh, architecture, like X64 versus yeah. the reduced instruction set. You, it's, it's actually technically like a modern X64 CPU is going to be faster at floating point than an ARM because the ARM is going to run at a lower clock speed and have less instructions. Okay. Uh, however, if you have a GPU that can do all that floating point and you can spend all that additional power savings on the on the CPUs and the extra cores to spend on the GPU, then you can balance out the system much better and have the CPU just focus on the core operating system itself and have the mm -hmm. GPU literally do the heavy lifting for everything else. And I think if you built the architecture from the ground up to support that scenario, you'd yeah. have a better experience. And that's why you see like cell phone games that have like graphics that look like modern consoles. You know, you're looking at these like right. self of these graphically accelerated games. And it's like the reason that's possible is because the arm chip is so efficient inside inside of the box. It's able to handle like 90 percent of the game's logic. And then the 10 percent of the graphics code can run heavily on a GPU chip inside of the same phone. And you don't have to worry about the heat from those two things competing with each other and like throttling them down. Like there's a lot more. It, it, it's almost like you don't have to worry about the power consumption so much as you have to worry about just the heat accumulation, even though those two numbers are kind of connected. Um, the less heat that you generate from the CPU, the more heat you're allowed to generate from the GPU and still have the overall heat load to, to you know, because they usually share uh, heat pipes and heat spreaders inside of the phone anyways, right? So your CPU and GPU are basically sharing, a, you know, a loop, if you will, like a, like a cooling loop. And because of that factor, you have to uh, take away from the GPU every time the CPU is generating too much heat. So ARM makes sense on a cell phone. But again, you have to program the software from the ground up to right. be efficient on ARM. And it's really difficult to take something that was designed for X64, which has a massive amount of instructions, right. and compile it to run on ARM. It's not like you can just change the compiler setting and say, give me an ARM version. You have to go in and change a lot of things out. Like, uh, I don't know the specifics, but I know like, uh, like you know, int 64 is like the large integers. Uh, some of the variables that they have that are available for you on X64 architecture are not available at all on ARM. Um, I know memory addressing stuff's a little bit different. So all those things that you, you have programmatically in your code in like a low level language like C, C++ or assembly, you have to fundamentally change the code before it'll build for ARM. However, if you use a high level language, like you're programming in like Swift, for instance, or using .NET yeah. Core or something sure. like that, then the compiler already knows how to create that intermediary language. You're already using like a pseudo language on top, and then it knows how to translate that for any architecture past, present, and future. So even if they came out with a new chip tomorrow that wasn't ARM, it was a completely new architecture, like hell, uh, quantum computers. Let's say quantum computing hits a point where it's mainstream, right? You could, in theory, take that code that was written for a high order language and still it might run like shit, but you could literally get it to compile and run on a quantum computer just by taking that intermediary compiler and changing it to say, anytime you see this, this or this on this CPU, you're going to want to change it to this, this and this. It basically nice. becomes like a translation layer and everything you see that's programmed on cell phones 
all uses a high order language. They all use high order libraries. They all use a high order language like Swift, or if you're programming in like C sharp or something like that, you're using .NET Core uh, or Mono. You're always using these libraries that keep it very, very high level. And that way you can just, dis you can distribute it to the store and Apple can, you know, pretty much guarantee that even if they come up with a future architecture, they'll be able to build and run that on that platform. Microsoft didn't have that when they came out with their Windows phone. When they came out with the Windows phone, it had a proprietary operating system on it that was nothing like Windows. It was its own proprietary cell phone operating system. Yeah. Um, and then they switched it to a real Windows 10 kernel. And when they did that, like 90% of the software library that was built for the original proprietary OS just stopped working. All the shit huh. that was made in original XNA just died. So the, like developers had to go and like retool all their shit to get it to build and run on the newer version of the operating system on the newer phones. And I think that was one of the things that kind of killed them. Not that they had a lot of market share to begin with, but its developers were just really frustrated that they completely changed, pulled the rug out on them and were like, oh, all your old software is not going to work anymore. Yeah. I, I, I remember when I was programming a little bit... Um it was Objective C just just prior to the the changeover to Swift, yep. And all of the all of the documentation that came out that that came with Objective C and from and like all of the standards and stuff from Apple, and this was six seven years ago, you could tell that they wanted to they they wanted there to be no difference between they were they you could tell the the path they were on to smush Mac OS and ios together they yeah. you could see the the groundwork being laid uh with the move over to swift where you could code a, a, an app for an i device mm -hmm. and it would just work on mac os uh, it's even in their compiler like you could be you could be sitting there or whatever not the compiler their development environment or whatever yeah. you you could be sitting there writing in objective c and you'd you'd have an option. Do you want this to export to iPhone or Mac OS? And it would, and you could just pick one, and it would wrap and you could go. So yeah, I, I totally feel like they are prepped and ready to go to make a move. People are complaining about, oh, if Apple does this, then they're going to fail. Mac's going to disappear because of software compatibility and blah blah blah. They have been. They have. Look, I, <laughs> I've I've encountered enough Mac hardcore Mac diehards. Yeah, if they make the move over to ARM and they lose software compatibility for, you know, Premiere and or um, whatever else, Photoshop. Basically, the entire Adobe suite is probably the biggest compatibility problem that they're going to have. Too bad they'll force you to use their own software. And they are, they are, and honestly, you could just use the iOS versions of those softwares that are available, and that's what they're going to make you do. Like, Apple yeah. is positioned in, in such a way that they can make this change, and if suddenly software doesn't work, well, they're going to say, too bad. They did it when the iPhone came out. Like, oh, you don't like that you can't buy all of these same apps that we have this walled garden? Well, too bad. Don't buy an iPhone. And it's going to be the same sort of mentality when it, when this happens is like, oh, you can't use your whatever. Well, too bad. Buy the Apple version or go buy a PC. It, and it's going to be too bad. The, the, the Apple fanboys will jump all over that shit, too. Yeah, you know the, it. It's not. It, I mean, it, it might hurt them a little. Like, people are going to bitch and moan and complain. But, like, they're, they're, they don't have to. Like they dominate their little sector of the market so much, and they, and there's the the cult of Mac so much that it won't matter. People will still they're going to use it regardless. Yeah, I remember programming in Objective C. Actually, the first the first oh mobile God. game that I ever wrote was a game called Air Beats that I co-wrote with uh, Greg, my friend that was working at Microsoft at the same time. And we got shot down by Microsoft. They said that we could not publish the game because it was in conflict of interest with their own mobile platform. And so we never got to actually publish it, but it was completely written in Objective C. And I'll tell you right now, Objective C is like the shittiest language on planet Earth. I liked programming in Objective C. Oh, it I hated so it. Easy. It was super. I I just like the transition between like C code and the way that they did Coco, the the UI stuff that was just like you'd be programming one language and then you just like switch to a different language, like right in the middle of your code, was really bizarre to me. Like I could never adapt to that. Being like a C plus plus guy. It drove me absolutely nanners that you'd just be like, you'd just be writing code and you'd just be like, okay, I'm going to just start doing square brackets and start like defining UI objects. And then later on, then you'd break out of that and go back into code and start like manipulating them. 
it was really bizarre to me. Like to me, that I, I never could get used to that. And I think that was just because I was so used to doing like Win32 style development, like with you know Windows sure. and message pumps and all that stuff. Which I'm yeah. sure any Mac user would look at that and say that's a silly way of doing it compared to Coco and <laughs> and Objective C. But still, I never could get used to Objective C, even being a guy that comes from a background. But Swift, on the other hand, I haven't played around with it a whole lot. But Swift seems like it opens up um, a lot of opportunity for new developers. Like, yeah, I think so. Yeah, Swift it seems like it's a simple, simple language. It was, yeah, it was like, uh, it, from what little I, I, I looked at it, it it's um, a very robust scripting language, it seemed like. It was it was very light. Um, yeah, what, like what would take, you know, six lines yeah. uh, in Objective-C could be done in three kind of a thing. And it's uh, very similar to, like, programming for uh, Unity. If you've ever done any, like, Unity development, um, it's super, super easy. Like, you can drag and drop a game. Like, even oh, cool. you, even you, if you're, you know, I know you say you're not a programmer, even though every day you, like, understand exactly how compilers work and I shit. You're like, I use Program Objective-C. It's like, whatever, dude. You haven't written code. Whatever. In you're probably a better developer than I was at Microsoft, and you're just all, <laughs> no. like, you're, you're sandbagging. So, uh, so Unity, I, the first time I ever used Unity... I wanted to just kind of figure out how to do something simple. Yeah. And it took me three hours to basically make like a shitty version of RC Pro Am from scratch, just stealing sprites off of uh, transparent PNGs on Google. So, so I literally just went and got a PNG of like an F1 car with a, like a green background that I could chroma key out. And I went and got like a bunch of tires, uh, like graphics of like tires and graphics of pavement. And I drug it all into Unity. And I basically drew a racetrack in Unity. I drew a wall and, and then I gave the wall weight. Right, and I right. gave the tires weight and I just put the sprites on the screen, literally drag and drop them like Photoshop on the thing. And then I put my car there. And all I did in the car is I double click the car. It opens up a car initialization function. I add a couple of features that are basically like when you apply acceleration, move forward at this, you know, this speed times the acceleration. And then when you brake, basically do the inverse of that. Right. And so that was forward arrow and back arrow. And then left and right was just rotate the sprite because it would always go in the direction that the sprite was pointing. And right. so all I did, and then I just added some physics to it. I just tweaked the gravity and I tweaked the rebound and I tweaked like the material. And it was all just like drop down boxes. And when I was done, I was like, run the game. And I'm like, whoa, I'm like driving the car and like drifting it around the tires. And when I hit a tire, the tire moves a little and the car like bounces off of it. And I was like, oh, dude, this is really, really cool. And I actually had Xander come up and play it for a little while. And Xander was getting a kick out of it. But he's like, oh, where's the sound? So what do I do? I go download a, a sound of a car engine idling and I put it in there. And then inside of the function, I just basically say, based on the speed, increase the play, the playback speed. Yeah. So, so, and so it's like, <laughs> and when you crash, it's like, <laughs> you know, like, it, and it, it worked perfectly. <laughs> and I didn't have to know any physics. I didn't have to know, yeah. at, you know, cosines and tangents. And I didn't know any, you know, and that's like shit you had to know back in the day to do that stuff. Oh, for sure. Yeah, well, because you're you're coding the physics yourself, you know. Yeah, it's so it's thankfully, so easy. So thankfully, like that that you know that sort of low level Newtonian yep. stuff is pretty. Again, it's you can find the algorithms and just copy paste all that shit. It's been done so many times. Yeah, I may which, even li live stream it at some point. Yeah, which is why Unity is so easy is because they've they've built all those tools and all that physics stuff has been done a million times and yep. that's what makes for a good game engine is that they've. They've done all that that hardcore heavy lifting stuff, or I guess the that's not the heavy lifting stuff, but it's like the the boring stuff that everybody's done a million times since 1985 and stuff. Yeah. And so. I just like the fact that you can just uh, wire up a controller too. Like if you want to play your game with a controller, you just basically import a controller object into your game. And to wire it up, you literally just go in and say, oh, when I push this button on the joystick, I want it to map to this other function that made the car go forward or accelerate. And now you got a controller that works in like 10 minutes. You know, it's like you don't have to go in and say, oh, find the controller device, enumerate it, see what kind of controller it is. See, I mean, you can literally just go in there and every controller has like a base class that represents it, whether it's a joystick or a gamepad. You know, and doesn't matter what the button layout is or how many analog sticks it has. It just Unity makes a bunch of assumptions. And you can use the minimal amount of functionality or the maximum amount of functionality. You can test to see if it's there. Does it have a second thumbstick or not? Does it have a D-pad? Does it have buttons? You can just ask it these questions and it'll come back and tell you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you can just ignore it entirely and say, oh, you have to have a joystick with this functionality. And if you don't, it, you're just not going to have access to it. Um, but I highly recommend if you want to get into game development, Unity, out of everything I've tried so far, Unity is by far the easiest. Dude, it's great. 
yeah and it can be super frustrating if you if you just jump in there and just expect it to be intuitive it's not like you're gonna want to go watch some tutorials but yeah, once you sure. get the basics like which is like create an object because even in 2d it's 3d that's the cool thing about unity is even when you're making a 2d game it's still 3d everything in unity is 3d they call it 2.5d right so i highly recommend yeah bracky's channel for unity oh i haven't seen that i haven't seen that one uh i'll, I'll paste it here in the chat um do it how difficult is it to program a 3D engine from scratch? My God, hard. It would, it, yeah, it'd be hard. massively hard. Well, yeah, in my opinion, like again, the physics is all there. Like you, you can get the math just anywhere, like eventually. But but making it work is, and it's just going to be so much time. It, yeah. It, and why would you? The the when Unity is literally free, like, and it's done for you already. Or or there's a good handful of of game engines that are that already just work yeah and you just have to figure out either their scripting language their internal scripting language or like so with something like unity which is based on c sharp um actually i think unreal is as well uh, also free um actually with unity you can use just about any language you want oh like, really you can literally use javascript like if you want to in unity you can use javascript for all the code and basically make like an like html5 game if you want but yeah yeah um just honest to goodness these days just use unity or even um game maker game maker by yo-yo games i think is what it is um there's plenty of plenty of really top-end games who have been made with game maker first and then you know port it over to a yep. quote, real, real language afterward um yeah so th there's no there's no reason to do it from scratch anymore I, I like how Knox has said he, he said he said his uh brother what was it he said his brother works for frostbite or Frozen Bite, and he said he will never work with Unity. Is is Frozen Bite the guys that made the Frostbite engine? Because that would make sense if they don't use Unity because they have the Frostbite engine. Like they're not going to use an engine that isn't an in-house engine. But it pretty much comes down to Unity, Unreal, and Frostbite are the three like major engines that you see deployed like everywhere. Uh, Unreal is probably the most deployed, though, because un Unreal. So the difference is Unreal 4. Are, are, is it Unreal 4 still or do they got a new version? So Unreal 4 is if you want to make a game that's purely 3D, Unreal is the way to go. Like if it's a complicated game with lots of pixel shaders and DirectX 12 and, and even re like ray tracing and stuff like that. Unreal is way more suited to, to like a mainstream game, but it's a lot harder to use compared to Unity. I tried both of them out and Unity was way easier to get going. Plus uh unity is good for creating 2d games and 3d games and when it comes to simple 3d games like talking like if you wanted to make something like a 3d flappy bird or crossy road or something like that unity is going to be way easier to create the game than unreal but the thing unreal has is massive optimization so so unreal like if you're doing like really really high-end pixel shaders and you want to like build like your own custom code for rendering and stuff then Unreal, I hear, is like the cat's ass. But if you want to use what, you know, basically have Unity take full control of the graphics stack, and all you're doing is telling it, like, what you want to draw and where you want to draw and what physics you want to apply to it, it's the better engine, in my opinion, for people that are trying to create, like, mobile games um, and games that aren't too complicated. Like, I haven't seen a lot of Unity games that are crazy complex. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like playing, uh, like, Far that's Cry, true. for instance. Yeah, that's true. So I think it just comes down to like, what do you want to do? Do you want to create a game where you just want a graphics engine? And Unreal is more than just a graphics engine. Unreal actually is, is gives you a lot of tools, but it's mainly a graphics engine. Whereas Unity is a game engine. Like it's, it's a full end to end game engine, everything down to the controllers, um, to the physics, to the world loop, how the game runs and being able to represent that all visually. Uh, there's I, quite a few really good games that I didn't realize were done in Unity. Like like what? Give me some examples. Kerbal Space Program, Ori and the Blind Forest. Wait, Kerbal Space, Space Program is Unity? Apparently. I never yeah. would have guessed that. That's pretty that's a pretty damn good example. Pillars of Eternity. Never uh, played that one. But it's it's a good uh isometric RPG. Yeah. I, I, I can see why Kerbal opted for Unity though, because Kerbal is a complete physics experiment. Yeah. And and that's what Unity is really good at is physics. Like one thing I like about Unity is you can literally just drag a ball in and create a floor, label it as a surface, put a ball above it and literally just set the gravity, the you can set the what do they call it? The rebound and uh the weight. You can oh. set all the objects, you just base they're all fields. Like all you do is apply what do they call it? It's a uh, a manipulator. You add a manipulator to the object in this manipulator, you basically give it mass, you give it uh 
you give it mass, you give it like its surface, like how much it rebounds. Is it more like rubber or is it more like steel? You basically apply the material science just by filling in some check boxes and then you just run the application. And what does the ball do? It just falls down and it just hits the surface yeah, and go. like bounces around and rolls around. It, and, and you can apply uh, like wind, like particle systems and wind and stuff like that that'll impart force on it sideways. And the cool thing is you just add all these things and it's just a sandbox you can play around in. Like even if you didn't want to create a game, let's say you just want to create like a screensaver. You yep. could just you could just create a loop that just gener like cr drag a ball in and create a loop that just every time that ball hits the ground it generates another ball at a random location. And then it falls when it hits the ground it triggers another ball being created. And then multiply that by 10, multiply it by 100. Now you got raining balls with physics all bouncing off each other and flying all over the place and you're like, "Holy shit, I did that." But what you really you didn't really have to write any code for it or very little code. Yeah. to do it. I bet you could actually do that without writing a single line of code in Unity. You could probably do that all through just text boxes and modifiers and properties for adding stuff, would be my guess. Yeah. What about what about Source Engine games? Uh, oh, like uh, like CSGO and stuff like that? I guess. I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't think know Source Engine's pretty dated, Valve. though, by most standards. I don't, yeah, I'm like, I don't really recall a non-Valve game that, that used the Source Engine uh, I mean, the, the original Vampire the Masquerade did. Uh, it looks like Titanfall did. But I can't... Yeah, I'm not really sure. And then a bunch of, like, you know, Gary's Mod and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think the... the I don't see the Source Engine actually used that much anymore. It used to be, like, the cat's ass for FPS stuff. Yeah, man, it was cool. I, so. I'm kind of a bummer that more... I was super... I loved Vampire the Masquerade game. That shit was so cool. I never I'm played really it. For the sequels coming, I'm like super stoked. It's freaking cool, but that was like the only one that really did anything. Is that sound coming from you? The background noise there? Oh yeah, it's my dog's. Oh, it's the dog. Okay, I keep taking on my ear cup and lifting because I, I keep thinking it's like something hitting my air conditioner outside my window. She's clacking around on the floor trying to get it. I think she found like a little rubber ball or something. She's just having a good old time. Yeah. Hey, bite my bits. Thank you for that five dollar tip. Sorry, I, I I saw that earlier. I was just waiting for an opportunity. He said to pay for TP shipping. I'm catching up with your score, Jerry. I'm folding it home, dude. I haven't been folding lately. I need to get back on that shit before you pass. You're gonna pass me on that. You're gonna pass me on subs. And and I think Miss Barnacles is shipping your toilet paper out. We we, we sent we sent out uh, a sheet before, but I think it got intercepted um, by somebody who really needed t toilet paper bad. So we'll get that shipped out to you again, bro. <laughs> Hang on a second, I gotta use the bathroom. Oh, you gotta, you gotta go pee pee? Okay, go for it. Alright. What an interesting show today. I hope you guys are enjoying it. Sorry for the technical problems with Zoom. We'll, we, I think we got them ironed out for the show next week. Um, But yeah, t today was has been a weird day for me. Like I said, I went to sleep at 3.30. I woke up at 8. Um, didn't really sleep. And ended up going for a walk. First time I've gone for a walk in, I don't know, I want to say like three months, three or four months. And uh, it was a very short walk. It was only about like 15, 20 minutes, but it was fun. Got out there with my family, got to get outside, get some fresh air, and it woke me up a bit. So uh, it, it, we're going to do it again tomorrow. We're going to try to do it every single day. Hey, what's up, Pat? He said, does the engine from scratch thing all, oh, wait, thing all the time, but there's games take forever to come out? Wait, does the engine from scratch thing all the time? But their games take forever to come out. Who, who? Oh, Nintendo does the scratch thing. Well, Nintendo also has weird architecture. So, so keep in mind that in Nintendo consoles and stuff like that, they have a very proprietary architecture. So, of course, they're going to build their own stuff in house because it's it's a total pain in the ass to adapt other engines to their stuff. Not to say that they can't do it, but that's generally why you see such a lead time on the Nintendo consoles because everything they build is like really bizarre. It's not super standardized. Um. But I'll tell you right now, building a graphics engine from scratch is a huge momentous pain in the ass. I actually did. I wrote a graphics engine for uh, creating Pong. It was a Visa graphics engine. I wrote it in mostly assembly in C when I was about 11 or 12 years old. And it was 65,000 lines of code just to build the basic graphics library so that I could tell it where I wanted to render a sprite, which was just an array that I created in, in space. I didn't even like import graphics. I made the graphics a pixel at a time. But but I had to create the graphics engine in the world loop. And those are 65,000 lines of code to do that from scratch. Um, you look at a modern game today, like you look at something like, uh, like Crisis or Call of Duty or something like that. Uh, the amount of code that would have to go into creating the graphics engine from scratch. First of all, 
you, you have to find you have to standardize on everything right which luckily for us in modern days that's pretty easy to do because you just have to make the decision do you want to be DirectX, do you want to be OpenGL, or do you want to be vulcan or do you want to support multiple iterations once you know what platform you want to support then there's a whole series of libraries that actually help you build your graphics library starting with their stuff so DirectX already gives you a lot of tools for for uh rendering 3d assets and stuff like that to the screen but unlike using a library like unreal and uh, unity you have to still define like the pixel shaders the scope the depth of field uh the physics a lot of games that need to do like special effects like if they want to do like special particle effects and stuff like that all that stuff has to be ground up program from scratch so all that math all that trigonometry and everything all has to be calculated and laid out by the user and that could be hundreds of thousands of lines of code just to build the foundation so that the game world looks cohesive right so that every that everything operates within the same rules of, or physics of the world whereas in unity or something like that they've already built the entire world the world is a, is a unit exists already um you can still write pixel shaders if you want to to make things look more realistic but they provide you a default shaders that you can use as your foundation so you can take an existing shader and just add to it instead of having to create it completely from scratch and so because you have all these basic items that are built on top of other items that are built on top of other items, you can pick what layer you want to jump in at and start programming. Yeah. So so in, in the basic objects, that's one of the things I like about object oriented programming, uh, which would be like C++ and C sharp and stuff like that. One of the things I like about object oriented programming and Unity serves this really, really well is you have this ob this this idea of inheritance, right? You have an object that's basic and then a more complex object that starts off with the basic object, builds on top of it. And then another object can grab the, the less basic object and create a more complicated object. And you basically create this chain of custody where you get to decide, do I want to create a Ferrari? Or do I just want to create a car? Or do I just want to create a chassis? Or do I just want to create a tire or a wheel or a bolt? You can go all the way down to that level and start where you want. Do I want to build a car from the ground up with a bolt where I do everything custom? Then start with a bolt. Do you want to just recreate a Ferrari with a different body? Then start one layer up from the Ferrari at like sports car, you know, rear wheel drive, mid engine sports car library. And then you could have front wheel, you know, front engine, rear wheel drive or rear engine, all wheel drive. You could have all these different like permutations of things that are all built from the same objects. So so it mirrors real life. But that way you don't have to create everything from scratch. Whereas if you're if you're starting with your own library and you're building your own library, you literally have to start out with what does the universe look like? Like yeah. you have to say, like, what does the universe look like? Then what does the planet look like? Then what is the, what what are walls? What is the floor? What is a wheel? What are all you have to define all these things from the ground up? And you can then be like a wizard and do whatever you want. Like if you want, you can just say, oh, I want wheels to just magically spawn, you know, and grow to infinite size and blow up the universe if I want. And nothing's going to fight you on that because there's, you get to define what the physics are of that world that you're creating. And Unity, the, the physics engine and everything's already there. So you basically impart the rules of physics and then yeah. it enforces them across the entire thing. Right. The framework is there, but then there's yeah. all the variables that you can adjust, like gravity and... Adapting. Exactly. And it makes it so much easier because if you... So so let me give you an example. So if you're writing your own game from the ground up, let's okay. say that you create an object. You you have to find a way to get that object to stay connected to the ground, right? So, so are you going to do true gravity? Are you going to go in there and do all the mathematical equations and everything like that to make sure that every surface interacts and you have friction and you have all this drag coefficient? Are you going to do all that? Or are you basically just going to say... Oh, keep the wheels connected to the ground and if you hit a bump then the car goes up by this many pixels and comes back down like an old atari game right something super super simple well with <laughs> unity you don't have to do that you have the simplicity of the atari game which is i just want to create a car that goes left and right but then you can go in and define the material of the tires the the, the materials of the suspension the material that's why you saw so many physics games coming out over the last couple of years you notice how there's a million physics based game with like ragdoll physics yeah, yeah. Well, that used to be like a really hard thing to do. You had to do a lot of mathematical calculations to do ragdoll physics inside of a world. Unity, you can do that just by like reducing the gravity down to like 0.5 and making everything a spongy object with infinite amounts of movement. And yeah. now everything you put into the world is just this like spongy object that just bounces and manipulates and distorts <laughs> off of things. Which is hilarious. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Uh, what is it like mount your friends? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mount or, or <laughs> what's the one that's banned from uh, Twitch? The... Uh, shower with your dad simulator, I think, is banned. Oh, but then there's another one. It's it's the one with the wieners. The oh god, what is it called? Like dong fighter. Or something dong, like that. yeah. It's like oh, what is that guy's? Guy? They'll know what it's called in chat. I'm just waiting for somebody to say it. Yeah. It's the one where yeah, you literally play like a ragdoll physics penis. Yeah. That like grows in length, and you basically like run around and try to, you know, hit other penises basically. What the hell is that game Unity called? 
development too easy? What do you mean too easy? Like there's no such to, thing as too easy, man. Like keeping on fucking game development. Genital jousting. That's it. That's the one. Yep. Like, what, come on, too easy. Like I don't understand what. That put it is. put it this way: if it wasn't for graphics library, if it wasn't for uh, graphics libraries and engines and stuff, you would not have had Flappy Bird. Like, I don't remember which library Flappy Bird used, but Flappy Bird was literally made in a weekend, and at one point it was making $4 million a day. Dude. Like, the dude literally took it down because it was scaring him how much popularity it got. He never expected that game to blow up like it did. And yeah. then as soon as he took it down, like, everybody else jumped on that and created a clone. I, he, yeah, I remember being super proud that my iPad had the original Flappy Bird on it after they took it out of the store. Yep. Hey, uh, hey, Charles, thank you for that two uh, that two pound tip. We appreciate those super chats. Ooh, Trevor Ward, thank you for the three dollars. Said this convo about programming is really interesting. Well, I'm glad you think so. Uh, Aaron, thank you for the membership. And Rob, Robert, uh, Robert Bear, thank you for the two dollars. He said, "Doesn't Half Life Alex use the Source Engine?" I believe it does. I believe it does, and I'm not saying the source. I'm not saying the source engine's bad, but I don't know what the licensing is for the source engine. So here, let's look. Source Valve, engine Valve, licensing. Because here, here's the other problem that you run into is if you create a game in Unreal Engine, it's free up to a hundred thousand dollars profit. So you can literally go download Unreal. You can create your own game on it. You can publish that game, and as long as you don't make over a hundred thousand dollars, you don't have to pay them anything. And if you make Do over a hundred million, with maybe the, it's a million the, now. It was it was a hundred thousand back when I was fucking with it, but. Uh, yeah. I think with the announcement of Unreal Five, you have up to a million before they take a cut. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. It, but but with uh with uh, but that's what that's with Unreal with Unity. I believe it's a hundred thousand, and then you just have to pay their licensing fee one time. Like you don't you have yeah. to. It's not even a perpetual thing. Or I think I think even to, like you can. I think you. Well, what like, does Source cost though? I've, I've Source is one engine I've never looked at what the cost is. Uh, let's see here. Let me look. Li licensing fee. This is uh. Oh, here we go. So for any Source Engine game that charges money, Havoc needs to be paid a license fee of $25,000 for the physics engine. You will need to pay this fee up front before making your game available for sale on Steam. Get out. So it doesn't matter how much you make. If you sell your game on Steam, you have to pay $25,000 up front. So that's why you don't see a lot of things using the Source Engine unless it's like a really big corporation. That's outrageous that's i that blows me away well that, i mean that explains why you don't see a ton of source engine stuff from like the the indie community right so what is okay unity licensing let's let me look up the unity license because unity has one of the best licenses for indie developers because like 99.9 .9 percent of people that use unity to make games never have to give them a dime yeah and the other cool thing about unity is you're allowed to republish unity with your own stuff like you can create your own assets to unity and like yeah. publish those and you're allowed to sell them like you can actually sell and make money for creating modules for unity which i think is pretty cool because some of some of the engines will be like no they'll even charge you a licensing fee for being able to expand upon their engine um where's i i, I want to say that unity was like uh okay here we go right here so yeah. unity for individuals it's free for students and it's free for personal use um, and it's a, yeah, revenue or funding less than $100,000. Oh, in the last 12 months. So you can make, you could literally make $99,000 a year selling your game and you wouldn't have to give unity a dime. Okay. Awesome. Dude. And that's great. That means, yeah. That's perfect. Honest to goodness, you could make a, a living off of your game mm -hmm. that you make in unity and never pay you unity a cent. And the best part is the only time you have to pay them is when you've made so much fucking money that it's not a big deal to pay them. Yeah, like they're That's literally letting you get rich before you give them a dime. Now, here's their business thing. So if you want to do a bit, so so that's for individual. That's if you're not an, if you so if you're licensed as an S corp and you are a legitimate like developer house, mm -hmm. then you have to pay forty dollars per month per seat for your developers. Okay, and so that for, to use their dev environment, so you have to pay forty dollars per seat. But that also includes you getting support, right? You're paying for the support from Unity to like help you develop stuff. Um, and then the eligibility is. Uh, you can get it for $40 per seat if it's less than $200,000 a year. So it doubles $40 wow. seat or for $150 a seat. Um, your revenue has to be great. Wait, it's okay. So it says if your revenue or funding is greater than 200,000 in the last 12 months, you are required to use a pro or enterprise license. So that's unlimited after that. So, so you basically you have to go from $40 a seat per developer to $150 per seat per developer, but then that's unlimited at $150 per month. You basically, can sell your work for unlimited amounts of money. There you go. And then there's an enterprise seat too. So if you have over 20 developers, then you have to get the enterpriser seat, which is two, 
two hundred dollars a month per seat. Um, and but that's only if you have more than twenty employees. So basically, those are going to be people that are like creating insanely huge games, right? Those aren't people that are that are just like fucking around. So I like their model. Their model basically scales with what you're building, right? If you're an individual, you don't pay anything. You become an expert in using it. Then you go work for a company. The comp as the company gets bigger and produces more profitable projects, you have to pay more um, to Unity. What I don't understand is do you only have to pay them during the development of the game? What happens once the game releases? Do you still have to keep paying them the $200 a month? Or can you still own that game in perpetuity and not pay them after that? Uh, it says if, you know, it says eligibility if your revenue or funding is greater than 200k for the enterprise one. So as long as your game is still producing in excess of 200k, you have to keep yeah. paying them per seat for your developers? Yeah. So and what the, that tells me is just fire fire 19 of your 20 developers, like, when your game's done. And just keep one <laughs> on board for, like, maintenance mode. <laughs> <I'm fucked up. laughs> just, for, just for support. Yep. What, was the, what was the cost on, uh, for Unreal? So, uh, unreal uh, what I understand, the Unreal 5 at least is free until you make your million. Gotcha. So, okay. So, um, here we go. Unreal Engine Q&A. Okay. So, here we go. The Unreal Engine License Agreement for Publishers. Let's see. Holy shit. This is a big document. <laughs> Licensing fee. Publishing fee. Uh, so creator, for creators and in industries outside of games working on internal and free project custom applications and your content. So, creator's license is free. Free, uh, publishing license. Uh, get started for free. Pay five percent when your product succeeds. Oh, got it, got it right here. Okay, so however, no royalty is owed on the following forms of revenue: the first one million dollars in lifetime gross revenue for each product. Mm -hmm. So, so once it exceeds one million dollars, then you have to pay them. Uh, gross revenue attributable to the product from the calendar quarter during which the gross revenue for such product is less than ten thousand dollars. That's yeah. kind of interesting. The first $5 million in gross revenue for each product from the Oculus store. So if you're making VR content, you actually can make way more before you pay them. So I think that's because they're trying to stimulate people to make more VR content, right? So they get to keep oh, more of their money. Sure. Uh, consulting fees and work for higher fees, which are non-recoupable for services performed using the licensing technology. An architect created walkthrough simulation or contractor deployed in-house training simulator, for instance. So like non-game stuff. Yeah. Revenue for unrestricted products, including for clarity, uh, revenue from products which solely rely on licensed technology for production in non-interactive linear media like broadcasting or streaming video files, cartoons or movies, and which is uh, in which is distributed in a form that does not contain the licensed technology or in order to deliver rely on servers running the licensed technology. So they have all kinds of different stipulations depending on like what type, like are you making a game? Are you making a multimedia engine? Like, they're definitely way more broad than Unity. Unity's like, basically make whatever you want, and then once you get over a certain number of people or a certain number of revenue, you pay us these fixed amounts of money. It, it looks like it looks like Unreal works more on, like, a royalty issue. Uh -huh. Like, like like if your shit's super, super successful, then you have to give them more and more money. Yeah. Um, so so they're, they're actually completely different models. Uh, but I still would say, just from my experience, and I don't have a ton of experience with Unreal, even though it's free to use, um, up to a certain amount. I never really invested much time into it because I was always under the assumption that Unreal was much more geared towards uh, like a graphics engine and, the, and, and some physics stuff, whereas Unity was more of like the full package and plus you could do 2D stuff. Right. Like, as I understood it, Unreal just was not favorable for doing 2D development. And a lot of the stuff that I wanted to create was like cell phone apps and stuff like that in yeah. games that were 2D because 2D is infinitely simpler to do than 3D. Yeah, I would have to say, yeah, if you're going to go, especially if you're aiming for 2D or or even mobile like that, yeah, yeah. Unity is going to go. Um, Unreal definitely is, is, I mean, uh, so many of the top, like, AAA games use Unreal. I just got a reply from John. <laughs> Did you see that? Oh, no. Tech support, stand him by. <laughs> That was my tweet earlier. I did a Puget system. Just I, I'm not really going to do it, but I was like, hey, I'm going to update my BIOS today because every time I update my BIOS, I end up like breaking my computer. So they're like, tech support, standing by. I like how he doesn't even discourage me, though. He's just like, tech support, standing by. You do what you do. Oh, oh my God. That's funny. That's good. Stuff. So, well, ho hopefully this conversation, this this segue into, into development, like gets people interested in programming because programming is like literally oh, yeah. one of the most rewarding things that you can do on a computer is creating something from scratch and not even like with a gaming engine. Like, honestly, like if you watch my old code gasm episodes, the stuff that you can do and just, you know, under a hundred lines of code and C sharp and windows 10 is actually pretty impressive. Like a lot of people are like, well, what, you know, that hard drive led program that I wrote for Puget systems back in the day, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. it's like, I think that entire program was like maybe 50 lines of code. 
Like, it wasn't very much at all to, to pull off putting a hard drive LED down there that actually worked off the I.O. And then you could just modify, like, two lines of code. By the way, that's on GitHub if you guys want to play with it. Go for it. You can change out any of the WMI providers. You could turn hard drive LED into a transmitter receive on your, on your uh, network connection. You could turn it into a thing that, you know, changes color depending on how fast you're typing. You know, you, you could change it into how much memory do you have available on your computer by displaying different various shades of colors from green to red. There's all kinds of different things that you can do with that same piece of code. You can infinitely modify it. And you guys are absolutely welcome to do that. And under a GPL, as long as you don't sell it, you guys are free to take that code that I wrote and modify it and redistribute it as much as you want. So if you, if you guys want to go take one of my programs and modify it to do what you want it to do, go for it, please, by all means. Hey, uh, let's see here. Uh, Zblatz. Zblatz, thank you for that 10 pounds, man. We appreciate that. Your super chats keep us alive and going. A fiver each towards your electric bill. We sure do appreciate that support, man. More now than ever, honestly. You the best. Mark said, downloading Unity right now. Going to try it. My, just just remember, Unity, is it, it's not so straightforward that you're just going to open it up and start like just dragging stuff around like Photoshop and just figuring it out as you go. Go watch a tutorial. There are, go, yeah. Millions of them. Just go watch a basic tutorial and the and like for just getting started what i recommend is looking at a tutorial not on how to do 3d but 2d look at the 2d or the 2.5d tutorials and they're going to show you how to basically create a uh, a surface like basically all a 2d game is in unity is a 3d game where the camera's fixed looking in one direction and it's not skewed like a regular camera where you get perceived depth or parallax it's basically a camera lens that's linear so like mario brothers as you move everything's in, even if it's far away from the camera it's the same size so, and you can switch between those modes in Unity, but I recommend doing that because then you can literally just go download graphics off of like Bing images and you could go download a graphic of a block and you could drag it in there and then you can a apply a thing to the block that says, make this a physical object. And then you can line up a whole bunch of blocks and then you can put some blocks up here and say that you want to apply physics to them, but you want to anchor them to the world in that spot. And if you add those couple things and you do it, you can literally create like Mario Brothers in an afternoon. Like Super Mario Brothers on the NES, you could create a clone of that in an evening if you just watch yeah, some basic yeah. tutorials. It's a very, very simple game to make. Just jumping platformer stuff? Yep. Yeah, because yeah, literally the hardest part about the whole thing because is, is the character, right? To make the character, you have to write the code to basically say, I want when the character jumps, right? When the character jumps, you have to basically just put in the physical attributes to say, okay, when he jumps, I want him to move in this direction with this velocity. And then the physics engine will figure out how high that means depending on where he's in the game or how fast he's running. You apply those attributes to him, and then once everything in the world has a physical attribute, then you can apply something called uh, uh, hitboxes. So and the hitboxes are really, really easy to do because if you have a graphic with a transparent background, you can literally apply a hitbox that just automatically makes a hitbox around the, the physical part of the image without the background. So, like, if you wanted a ball, for instance, right? If you had a ball, but the sprite is square, all sprites are square, but you have a ball, well, you want it to actually hit the ball from all the different angles. You don't want it to, like, hit a box, even though there's a ball there. So you apply one of those uh, one of those hit boxes to it, and it'll automatically wrap around the ball because it's the only visible part of the image. And now if your little Mario guy is running along and you jump into the ball, the ball is going to stop you, or you can apply physics so that the ball gives a little bit. So, like, when you hit it, it goes up like an inch and then comes back. Right. So you can do all that stuff just by adding modifiers to all the objects. And then for scoreboard and stuff like that, that's just writing little bits of code that say, oh, whenever you collide, whenever there's a collision between your player and any one of those boxes in the game, you get to determine what type of a box it was you hit and what's the end result of that. How many points do you get? Does something does another object appear above the box like a mushroom or something and go left or right? You, you can. It, it's so easy to do in Unity over time. So pick a game that you want to do. Like, if you want to make, like, something like Mario Brothers. Mario Brothers is probably one of the simpler ones to do. Tetris is also really ridiculously simple. If you'd like to make a Tetris game in Unity. But figure like out. Of, uh, what, what's like that? One of those uh, Brick Breaker games, like Arkanoid. Oh, uh, that would actually be super simple. Yeah. You got some good basic physics there. Um, or, like, a pool pool game would yep. be, be pretty fun. Same same kind of deal. You got, you got some basic physics there. You got collision detection. You've got... Uh, you know all that all that good stuff to really kind of get you started and understand um, yeah yeah it's actually it's and, and once you do it it feels so good like like when you get something to do what you want it to do like when I made that top down like little RC program game yeah I was like dude if I could do this in three hours what could I do to keep refining this 
Like, oh, yeah. I think I, in, I added a smoke trail because all I did was just add a particle system. They have all kinds of particle systems. So I oh, said, yeah. make a particle system, make the particles black, and then diffuse them so they look like a little smoke. And then I was like, when the car goes forward, just shoot a particle system in the opposite direction out the back of the car. And the faster you accelerated, the physics would stretch out the particle field. Okay. So, so it looked like you had exhaust coming out of the car. And it's like, you could just keep adding features like that. You could make it wreck. Like, if the car crashes into something, change out the sprite with a wrecked car. Or, or add deformation to the sprite. So, like, when you crash into something, it actually crumples up the sprite. You know, you can do stuff like that. And and it's it's actually one of those things where it's like you start with something simple. You don't have to sit there and storyboard and shit. Like, back in the day when you created a game, you sat down, you storyboard the whole thing out. You figure out, like, where the physics were going to be, how objects were going to interact with each other. With Unity, you can actually play it way more fast and loose. You can basically just create a world, like, lay down a flat surface, start applying objects to it, and just see how things interact with each other and just tweak them. You know, and, and, and like make your little level. It's kind of like Mario Builder in a way. Have you ever played like Super Mario Builder? Like where you oh. build the Mario level like on the on the Wii U? No, but I, I know I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So so it's similar to that. Not quite as easy as that, but very similar to that where it's like create yourself a level, run your guy through it. If he can't jump far enough to make the gap, then make the gap smaller or make him run faster until you get everything right on the edge of where he can just barely make it and he can barely do it. And then add a scoring system. And then you just build level after level after level and let her let her rip. And it'll do most of the optimization for you. That's another thing that I really, really like about Unity is you can be grossly inefficient. Like, you got to be careful, like, with, with software development because you might say, okay, create an object, and then you go and create another instance of an object, another instance of an object, and then you create an instance of a collection of those objects, and you keep doing that infinitely, and you just run out of memory, or your CPU is so slow it can't render the whole thing. Unity is smart enough to know that if you add a bunch of assets to the screen, and they're the same types of assets, it'll do optimization and caching and stuff like that to a certain degree on the back end. So if you create like 700 of the same block, if you do it in the proper way, Unity will say, oh, I know these are all the same blocks. These are the properties that are going to change, and these are the properties that are going to remain the same, and that way it doesn't duplicate all the shit that's going to remain the same. It can basically like use references. So instead of having 20 blocks that all eat up, you know, the same amount of memory, it'll create one block and then it'll create 20 references to it in different positions so that you have one block loaded into memory, but just a little bit of memory is being used to replicate that block in a bunch of different locations. So, so it's stuff like that that Unity does that I actually like have a lot of respect for it as far as you can still be a shitty developer and make something cool. <laughs> And that's not a bad thing. Like, I, I will be the first to admit, even when I worked at Microsoft, I wasn't very well known for writing highly optimized code when I first started programming at Microsoft. But what I was known for is solving problems very quickly. You would always have people be like, well, we're going to need a dev team of like five people in three weeks to get you a prototype. And I'll be like, dude, I'll go, I'll go home and get this shit like banged out, you know, and give you one tomorrow. And they'd be like, oh, you can't do that because of this, this, this. And I'd write the most spaghetti code shit with like go-tos and jump points and try catch blocks everywhere. And it'd be like the most ugly, inefficient thing you've ever seen in your life. And they'd always be like, oh, well, how'd you handle this problem? How'd you handle this problem? What'd you handle this problem with the server down? How'd you write that code? I'm like, I didn't. I literally just fucking retried everything a million times until it works. Huh. And they're like, well, that's the dumbest fucking thing I've ever heard in my life. But then it ends up working and we never ended up making a better version of it because it just worked. Oh, there you go. That's yeah. that's rule number one, man. And, and like, non shipping code, mind you, I'm not going to say Microsoft shipping code was technic was was so bad. But internally, generally, the way it worked is you'd write a piece of code. They'd code review it and be like, OK, this is all fucked up. There's five thousand bugs on this code. And then they would ask you the question. They're like, has the program crashed or had any problems? Have you had to reset it? What's the reliability rate on it? And you're like, well, the reliability rates like 99 percent. And they're like, oh, well, fuck it. Just fix all these things next time. You, you know, think about these next time you're doing a project. Don't mess with it. Don't <laughs> if it's working, just leave it alone. Don't yeah. Touch it. Yeah. Memory and CPU is actually cheap in the in the server world. Right. Uh, oh. Not not always. But 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 for for Microsoft, it was incredibly cheap. So they would rather have inefficient code that was stable than incredibly efficient code that was hard to debug. And uh, yeah. it was expensive, which makes sense. Really? I mean, yeah. When when it when just works is kind of more important just works is is a fantastic thing and, and don't ever be embarrassed by by writing shitty code because even the best developer on earth writes shitty code in the beginning trust me i've mentored so many developers in my career that were absolute just fucking spaghetti coders like to the point where like i shit you not like two of my developers that i had on the centralized triage team when i started that team at microsoft they they gave me their uh their programs for um 
basically we were creating a website that basically pulled in a bunch of SQL queries and generated real time graphs that would update in real time. So basically think of it like a live HTML5 web page with ch like Excel charts, but the Excel charts were living. They would move in yeah. real time, updating like every three or five seconds on the client side um, using HTML5 and Ajax to do the server push thing. Well, uh, they gave me their code and it was literally every single line of code. It was literally like a thousand lines of code written inside of the initialization function. There was oh. basically like the equivalent of you just opening main and just writing 10,000 lines of code and that's your entire program. No. They didn't they didn't have any function. They didn't make any external functions. They didn't make any external classes. They didn't compartmentalize oh. things. They didn't use any oh. interfaces. Yeah, it, it was it was absolutely garbage, but it worked. Like if you looked at it, it, when you bring it up in the meeting, you're like, wow, this looks great. This looks fantastic. But then you go look at the code and you're like, my God, if anybody sees this, we're all fired. Yeah. Uh, so... So, but, but then that's a good teaching point though. Cause like if they can write all that code in one function and actually get it to work flawlessly, it's actually not that hard to start teaching them how to break out the components that they're using over and over and over again. Cause right. th that's the, that's the general rule in programming is go ahead. I, I can't even, I can't even wrap my head around not breaking out functions and, and, and that. Like I can see not not having like a bunch of objects or classes all broke out and stuff like that. Sure. But not 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 defining like I don't understand. I mean, I guess I could, you know, it's linear programming at that yeah. point. You're, you're just one one line after another, after another, after another, and then referencing back if you have to or something. But man, I, it, it, wow, I just I don't know why. Like it's it, it's not even. It would be so unnatural to even try to do that. Like my fingers wouldn't want to do it. it it's just so. And, and, and yeah. I guess that's because of, I, I learned from the ground up object oriented programming, and so I don't. You See, know, you were you were lucky. You were you were raised where there was rules. Like yeah. an object oriented programming, you have to have rules. Like can can you be a sneaky bitch? Yeah, you can, but it's harder to do. And C. It's all sneaky bitch. Like the way that we used to refer to it is in an object oriented code. You basically have the universe has rules. Right. And and in a procedural code, like just straight up C, you're just a wizard and you can just create reality whenever you want. Ugh. Like 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 we'd, we'd write programs all the time. Actually, my worst program that I ever wrote was when I was like 11 years old. I wrote a 3D Starfield based Pong game. They had like this 3D Starfield move in the background of it. It was hardware accelerated Visa graphics 64480. It ran in DOS. And I had to write the graphics library for it, a Visa graphics library that was 65,000 lines of code to write a Visa graphics library so that I could basically get it to work on all different graphics cards because there's no standard back then. Like right. some graphics cards wrote to the memory in four banks of RAM. Some of them were linear. It, there was all these weird things like Cirrus Logic did shit different than uh, Diamond and stuff like that. So, so I wrote this huge graphics library and then the Pong game itself was only like maybe six or 7,000 lines of code on top of that to do the Pong game, but it was all written in main. It was literally, my world loop was literally just starting a while true loop inside of main and then writing like 6,000 lines of code. And that was the entire game. And that's, that's how people like used to do it just to, just to program stuff very fast. But the thing I like about object oriented code is you just follow a couple simple rules. You ask yourself when you're writing the code, will I ever use this again or potentially use this again? Right. And if that's the answer, then you make it a function. Yep. And then if it's a function of an object, like you, you use that function specifically to manipulate some aspect of the object that it's inside of, then you make sure you create an object for it. You don't make it a static function. You make it a dynamic function that runs as an instance of it, right? Difference between just running a static function or creating an instance of the object and then running the function. There's all these little rules that you follow. And then once you follow those rules, you end up noticing that you actually can't create bugs as easily. Because oh, yeah. if you try to use shit outside of its scope, the compiler yells at you and says, oh, no, listen, you can't fuck with the tire on the car unless you get the wheel first. And you can't fuck with the wheel unless you get the car it's attached to. And you can't fuck with the windshield on the car unless you have the whole car. You know, it's like there's there's, there's an order of operations and everything's connected in a symbolic way. And I like I do, I too. Like, it made sense. It does. Object-oriented programming just, it, it makes sense. Like Absolutely. Have, the inheritance stuff and scope makes sense. And, like, it all... Yeah, I just properties and all of that stuff. It just, I I don't know. It made sense for me, and like, it's it's just a because it, it represents. It's almost a it's a better representation of how the real world works. Yeah, you know? like, you know, like that's. I mean, it's just it just does. Like all cups share similar attributes, right? And but if I want my cup to be blue, well, then I just change the the color attribute to blue, or do I want it to be bigger well then i change the volume 
property to whatever I want it to be or shapes. And like, it's all, it all makes sense. Yeah. And it all cascades. That's the other thing too, is like, if you alter a parent object, all the child objects get updated too, if you want. Yeah. So like, for instance, a car, if you wanted to change the, the wheelbase on a car and elongate the car, um, or maybe you want to make the wheels bigger as a result of that, there's a golden ratio. You can actually have that implemented at the class. So you don't have to do it. And then you don't have to think about this shit. You're like, oh, I want the car to have a larger engine. And then it can yell at you and say, listen, you can't exceed this many cubic inches because the car can't hold a, an engine that's this big or the engine's too small to fit in there. You can actually program those limitations into it. So the developer that's using your object can't exceed whatever limitations you put on it. And that makes debugging so much easier. And that's how that's how all programming that that I do now. It's all right. object oriented. Like I, unless I'm doing something like JavaScript or I'm just writing a quick script or something in PowerShell, everything that I do is object oriented because it's a lot easier for me to keep track of what a project's doing when I don't just have God like capabilities to change anything at any time. Because it's really difficult to debug something where you're like, you just want to magically change something like you're, you're 5,000 lines into some crazy piece of code. And you're like, I just want to go back and change this because it's easy. I just, I, I'm just going to go back there and change this random element. And then you have to figure out all the millions of places throughout the code that that little change is going to fuck with stuff. But with object-oriented programming, you really don't have to worry about that because you know the limitations of the object that you're using. And if you try to go outside of those limitations at any point or touch it when you're not supposed to, when it's not in scope, it tells you no, you cannot. Yeah. Yeah. It'll slap like you. And, and it keeps you from making a lot of really, really stupid mistakes, especially when you're being lazy, like I was a lot of the time. Oh, yeah. Hey, Robert, thank you for the $10, man. I really do appreciate that. He said, I see some games on Steam that run on the Source Engine, but do it by being a mod of the Source Engine. Yeah. I don't think you can charge for it, but how does licensing work for that? Um, it didn't look to me like Source Engine was GPL, so I don't know how you could just break that off and make your own version of it without well, paying license. Mod, right? that, that was a mod for, and that was free for the longest time. Oh, uh, I see what he's saying. Okay, just to be clear, that's not a mod on the Source Engine. What that is a mod on a game that uses the Source Engine. So, like, for instance, Gary's mod is on Half-Life. So they're, they're literally using half... They're making a mod for Half-Life. Just like you'd make a mod for GTA to, like, add another car to it, right? You're not, you're not modding the graphics engine. You're modding the game that uses that engine. Right. So, so in that case, the licensing's fine because you're, you're actually modding the game itself. You're not modding... Um, you're modding the game itself. You're not modding the engine. Now, as I understand it, Gary's mod did go up, up for sale, correct? Yeah. So, so so if they were selling Gary's mod, they would have had to get permission probably from uh, the creators of Half-Life to sell that because they would be creating... Unless Half-Life already said it was okay to mod their game. If, if it was okay to mod their game and they, they may have had some licensing thing that said, hey, anybody that wants to make a mod for our game, you guys can sell it or do whatever the hell you want with it. But yeah. because the Half-Life already paid to use that library... Because you're modding the game and you're not modding the library, even though the library is involved, you know, as a part of the mod, it doesn't work that way. Like the licensing is owned by the game and you're creating a mod for the game. So therefore, you'd have to take your licensing through whoever created the game you were modding. So I think I think that's how it would technically work. I mean, you guys are welcome to go get some more information on that and you could educate us. But I'm just saying, from my point of view, that seems like the fair way that it would be handled. Yeah, because like, like something as an example, like um, the, the Stanley Parable. Um, it looks like it started yep. as a as a free mod hey, wait, for Half Life Two. You uh, RTX didn't <sighs> catch that one. <laughs> I don't have RTX on. <laughs> um, and so and so yeah, so like Stanley Parable was it says here was originally released as a free mod for Half Life Two, and then later released as a standalone remake using the Source Engine. So like at first, um, you know, like it's a free mod. You can just tweak it and you can't charge for it because it's it's technically underneath but then you've he went and remade the game proper under the source engine and it's not a mod anymore it's standalone oh then um, i'd imagine he would have had to pay the 25 grand. the 25 grand like which which makes sense because like i imagine the dude got bunches of you know donations and stuff like hey you know i know i've got this for free but if you want to buy me a coffee and then um you know it, it went up on the green light thing um so yeah, it's it's there are there are ways. I mean, Gary's mod too. I think I don't think Gary's mod is free anymore, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I have Gary's mod, now, and I thought I paid for it. Or it, it was at one time free, or is now. The I'm other sorry. the other thing that you got to factor in here too is keep in mind that if you're writing a a game based on the Source Engine that literally is just an advertisement for the Source Engine, like Gary's mod is literally like an advertisement for the Source Engine, chances are they probably waived the licensing fee and signed some kind of a contract with them saying that, oh, listen, your game actually brings us a lot of attention 
because you're literally like pointing out the source engine and everything that you're doing is literally based on the source engine. So, so you're basically a giant advertisement for the source engine. So we're going to go ahead and waive that $25,000. That's, that's obviously something the company's allowed to do. That, just like, just like with YouTube, you know, people, I get people that contact me all the time. They're like, oh, hey, we got this software suite or something like that. Do you want like a free, you know, lifetime license to it or whatever? So you could check it out and review it. You know, I have companies do that all the time where they'll just waive a licensing fee because they're hoping that I'll do a review on it or something or I'll talk about it or I'll make something with it. And other people will be like, oh, man, that's really cool. And then they'll go buy it. Yeah. You know, so I so it's probably similar. How, I think that's why Unity is 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 so is just basically free because like they always have that splash screen. Like yeah. Anything. I'm playing a free to play mobile game. There's always that made with unity splash screen. So it's like, that's, you know, that's, yeah, I think you actually get that with the free unity too. I think that's like, if you make a unity game and you're not paying per seat, you're not an enterprise and you're an individual. I do think you do get that unity thing popping up. Cause I remember everything yeah. I made in unity. I always got that unity pop up and I don't know if that was something you could disable or not, but it was by uh, default on. I don't think so until, unless you pay, I think that's, that's part of the deal is, is, we're gonna put our splash when you first start, which oh. fine, whatever. It's hardly intrusive, and and, and yeah. hide the loading of your app. Like that's it's a perfect UX. Like I don't know injection, I guess. Like yeah, it, it's perfect. So Andre Williams said Valve contacted the maker of Gary's mod, trying to get him to sell it, but he refused several times. Ah, good. so I would have. So because he refused to sell it, obviously he didn't have to give him jack shit. So and that's probably why they were mad. <laughs> Cause they're like, they're like, dude, sell it. This is going to make so much money. He's like, nah, but wait, does that mean Gary did Gary's mod two get sold? Cause, or, or did he just do the same thing again? Just to stick it to, to the valve guys. That seems weird, man. Like, cause Gary's mod would have made a bajillion dollars, dude. Like that was a really bucks. famous thing. Gary's mod is 10 bucks on fucking. Oh, it's 10 bucks right now. So he's obviously selling it now. So if it didn't start out for sale, it's damn, it's for sale now. So huh. it looks like greed wins out always. Um, Dave S, thank you for the 50 sexes. We love those sexes. Thank you, Dave. Shicka dance. Thank you for that $10, Mr. Shicka dance. He said, Hey guys, just showing my support. Did you know someone made an upgrade to the Elder Scrolls 2 Daggerfall using Unity? You can add mods. I played the game when it first came out. Keep up the good work. I did not know that. I loved Daggerfall. I never played Daggerfall. Dude, it, it's a throwback to when not Dabber. That's pretty damn cool. That's cool. I'll have to check that out. Daggerfall Unity. Oh man, I wish I wish there was more of. <laughs> they wore him down. <laughs> that, that Daggerfall had, um, because like once, once I mean Morrowind had had some really good flexibility as well, but like, I loved Morrowind. I yeah, love Morrowind. But like Daggerfall was huge for one. It's still I think Daggerfall is still the biggest, um, at least Elder Scrolls map because a lot of it was procedurally generated. Um, and it's, it's huge. Let me look it up here. How old? It's got to be pretty old, right? If it's oh, Elder it's Scrolls 2, it's got to be really old. It's like freaking 1995 or something. It's wicked old. But, um, what I, what I missed the most, there are two big things I missed from Daggerfall the most is like the, oh, it's like free. The, you can just download it and play it. Wow. The boon, you had these like boons and, and banes or something. I can't remember exactly their you could like you could like make your character allergic to silver or iron right and so okay. you couldn't ever use any iron weapons or armor and so that'd give you like plus two points that you could then put into um like bonuses for yourself so mm -hmm. like oh i'm allergic to iron but i'm really smart or you know that kind of a thing yeah um, like you have to have a weakness to have a strength yeah and uh i also then i also miss being able to bash uh locked items like you could kick a locked door down it would make a lot of noise and, and potentially alert like guards or, or the homeowner or whatever uh -huh. um but if you couldn't pick the lock you could always just bash the door down or break open a, a chest or something um and i miss which like if you if it was a chest you run the risk of breaking items inside the chest yeah uh, but it gave another option like okay um i may not be a rogue who can pick locks and stuff but you know my freaking half orc with a two hander could still break a door down you know i miss that kind of thing yeah i'm actually installing it right now guess guess how much space is required to install daggerfall 33.5 megs Jeez. oh that's the original yeah when this shipped it must have literally been on like floppy oh. disks you can download oh, yeah. it for free i just i just went to elder scrolls bethesda.net and it's like download for free and i'm installing it right now and it just downloaded three thirty three point five 33.5 megabytes of data and that's how much it, space it needed and it's fully installed right now Oh, oh, hold on. Hold on. 
It said 33.5 megs downloaded. Now it's 106 megs downloading oh, through Bethesda.net. So I think oh. it might be downloading a launcher or something. It's Dude, been, it's the packed with all those textures. Dude, the launcher is four times the size of the game. Goodness. Dude, what, what kind of world do we live in where the launcher, the stub that literally executes the game, is four times the size of the game it's executing? That's terrible. Oh, it's actually loading. Let's see. Let's see if we can crash the stream. Oh, I got to create an account to play it. Okay, fuck that. I'm out. I'm out. You have to have a Bethesda account to play. I might check that out later, though. I downloaded and installed it. It's small. If you guys want to get it, if you want to get Daggerfall for free, it's pretty I, decent. Yeah. Honestly, I mean the graphics are pretty terrible, obviously, because it's like freaking Windows three one days. Or Dude, whatever. the games with terrible graphics usually allow you but to do the most stuff, though. That's like, what I'm saying. Graphics are the limitation always. Oh man! Like my favorite game, my favorite online game of all time. Here, I'll put a link in chat for you guys if you want to go get it for free. It's only like thirty three point five megs plus one hundred and six for the launcher. Um, I I really loved Ultima Online. I loved, yeah, same. That same. was probably one of my favorite MMOs of all time, and I had some of the most like crazy adventures and stories in that game that wouldn't be possible in anything like World of Warcraft and stuff. Like just because of the, uh, it was everything was played so fast and loose, right? Because graphics didn't really matter, and they didn't need like all these like graphical interactions and physics and stuff like that. It's like you could just get away with just crazy amounts of shit. Like they could just make stuff up, yeah, you know. And I love that. I absolutely love that. There's a there's a it's called Albion Online it, and it has a very similar. Um, oh, I've never heard of that. A, a similar take on on MMO where like you you build your skills by actually using the um, like if you want to get better at axes, well then just use an axe more or like you know you pick up a fire oh. staff and you'll get better at fire magic and and stuff like that. Um, and I think at some point there's like certain areas you can you eventually get to more and more like dangerous areas and it has like a full loot. PvP. Dude, when did this come out? This actually looks really badass. I'm a I'm a fan. Uh, I I jump into and cool thing you can actually download a mobile version, um, at least for Android. I don't know for iOS, but um, and it's basically the same game. You can load up your your character, the same character that you play on PC, and 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 work out there and stuff. That is cool. It's pretty neat. It's supported on Windows, Mac, OS 10, Linux, and Android. There you go. That's pretty awesome. And it's supported on Windows 7, 8, Windows 10, Mac OS 10.7 or higher, uh, Ubuntu. Um, it says other distributions will work too. So Ubuntu or Steam OS both support it, or Android 5.0 or higher. Wow, so this will run on like everything. Yeah, I, I, I think it's it's pretty cool. I've, uh, I'm just like installing all this malware on my computer. There we go. It's installing. Nah, it's, it's really good stuff. And I think it's free to play. It and, is. It's, and, it's, yeah, it's said right on the main page. It's a really, it is a good, uh, like, ethical sort of um, free to play. In my mind, it, they did a good job implementing it. So it's not going to, like, pop up a thing on my screen that says if I, if I don't want to die every five minutes, no, I have to pay no, him 20 bucks? No, no timers, no weird stuff like that. Um, oh, well, that's cool. I wonder how they make their money. Yeah, their microtransaction stuff is actually pretty good. Oh, okay, uh, okay. Mounts and stuff. I think, they're, I think you can buy... Um, like crafting materials or something. I can't remember exactly. There, I've, There's probably some pay to winness to it, but um, yeah, I think. I mean, there's pay. There, there's there's raid shadow legends pay to win, and then there's like world of warships pay to win. Yeah, so. more 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 world of warships. I feel. Gotcha. Where where it's like possible to actually play the game without getting too frustrated without buying anything. I I have a good time with it. Where I I, I like the just, graphics, dude. The graphics are actually like really refreshing. Yeah, and this is all done in Unity, by the way. This whole game is Unity. That uh, is so cool. Hence why they can keep it free for now. And and that's that cross-platform uh, ability too. Yeah, it's like code once, and then you can you can distribute it wherever. Oh, that's actually that's actually I, I didn't even mention that earlier. Yeah, is, is Unity? You can I think there's 23 platforms they support right out of box. And I mean it's weird platforms too, like Samsung TV. If you, if you have a Samsung television, you can literally like make a Unity game that runs on your Samsung television. There's like Samsung TV, LG TV. Um, I think you can even make an app for smart for the smart fridge, like certain smart fridges. But no it, yeah, if you install Visual Studio and you install install Unity, it'll install Visual Studio because that's what it uses as its editor. You can also use other editors. But when you open it up, when you go to build your project, it'll it'll give you a list of like, I want to say it's like twenty plus platforms that you can build for, and some of them are like really really weird platforms, like you didn't even know like existed. Like the Ula or whatever. Yeah, like just weird, weird shit. Like it's and, and the cool thing is you don't have to alter anything in your code to build for those platforms. Oh, one of them, by the way, is Xbox. If if nice. if, if, if you want to build your Unity game for Xbox, I mean, I think you have to. 
uh, to publish it to the Microsoft library, I think you have to jump through some hoops. But um, if you just do the dev license thing, uh, you can actually deploy it and test code and run run games on your Xbox, like your Xbox One. So that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. Uh, there are some limitations though. Like there are certain things in there. Like when you build it, they'll they'll want you to do like certain things. Like if you're publishing to Xbox, obviously they're going to want you to go in and add controller support and all that stuff. You'll still be able to build it, but you just won't be able to use it unless you add the things that are necessary for each platform. But in theory, if you add everything that's asked of each platform, it will build for every single platform. You can just blanket build it for everything. Yeah. And I actually think that's really really cool. Uh, let's see here, Dave. Dave, thank you. Thank you for those sexes, buddy. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you for the 20 sexes. Dave's not here. Hey, Dave, Leviathan, Prim, thank you for the $2. Said, hey, Jerry, special gift. Just made it to your P.O. box. Awesome. After the stream, I'll go pick it up. Woo. I need to go take the old STI for a drive before the battery dies again. So after the stream, I think I'll, I'll run down to the old P.O. box and pick up my anthrax. Hey, Dave S., thank you for the 100 sexes. Ooh, he gave us 100 sexes this time, man. We're getting super sexed up today. He said, I've got a slight problem with my new Fractal Design Celsius S24 AIO. And that is that the radiator fan runs at 100% all times. Any ideas? That's your wheelhouse, bro. Uh, I'm not sure what the stock fan is for that. Uh, if it's PWM um, or or three, like, is it three pins or four pins? Um, but it's all going to depend on where you've got it plugged in at. Honestly. Actually, that's a good point because your AIO is going to get its fan speed from the motherboard header. So yeah, wherever you yeah, and so um, it's probably going to come down to a BIO setting, regardless of whether yep. it's four pin PWM or three pin voltage. You're gonna you're gonna find out the header that you've got it plugged mm -hmm. into, um, and adjust your BIO settings for that that header. There's a cool universal program. I don't know if it's if there's if it's still standardized or not. But have you heard of CPU Fan? Uh, no. There's a program called CPU Fan. I think it's an open source program that you can download. It's like really old, man. This goes back to like. Let's see here. Let's see if I can find it. I think it's called CPU fan. Uh, let's see here. Oh, speed fan. Sorry, speed fan. Have okay. you heard of speed fan? Nope. So, so download a program called speed fan. Um, oh, it's actually up to date. 2020 Windows 10. Okay, cool. So if you download speed fan, it lets you go through and pull a bunch of settings from your BIOS, like standardized settings from your BIOS, and you can even set some of the values. And one of the things I remember in that program is you can actually set fan curves and stuff like that. And it's like universal and it supports across multiple brands and multiple motherboards. So you don't have to download like the specific software for your motherboard for controlling the fans. And then what you could do is if it'll list all the fan headers that it finds, you can go in there and just play with the percentages and see if it slows or speeds up the fan. And whichever one does successfully slow it down and speed it up, you'll know which header it is at that point. And then you can create a fan curve for it. And I think you can even base it off of the heat from the processor. So you can like go into speed fan and basically map your curve and says, oh, and the CPU gets to like 60 C, run it at 80%. If it gets to 70 C, run it at 100%. And then you can basically create your own curve. Yeah. And there's also in your, I'm sure your motherboard, if you, if you go to your motherboard manufacturer's website, I'm sure that they have a fan controller software too. I've seen one for Gigabit. I've seen one for Asus. And honest to goodness. So your motherboard should have a header, uh, any more modern uh, motherboard it should have a, a dedicated header for yeah. a pump. It'll be labeled as either one of the case fans slash pump, or it'll be all on its own, a pump header. Yeah. Pump should be on that, and you should just turn, you should essentially turn off any sort of throttling of the pump. The pump should run at max, in my opinion, should run at max all the time. But then your, whatever fan is on the radiator yeah. should be plugged into the CPU fan header, which will be separate and, and, uh, all on its own. Like, I mean, I'd be surprised awesome. if the pump even had a speed, like like a speed output. Yeah, yeah, you can adjust. Uh, yeah, oh, you it, can? Okay, yeah, interesting. You can Usually, yeah. I don't know why you would. Like, the, in my, like I said, in my opinion, the pump should be maxed out all the time, honestly. It's, I don't know why you wouldn't want to circulate. Yeah, variables, variable speed on a pump seems like it would it would wear it prematurely to me. I don't, yeah, I don't know why you would, would not um, basically turn the header off so that it runs at max all the time, but I don't know. Some people, some people don't. Weird. Well, I mean, most most pumps are like pretty dead silent, anyways. So yeah, yeah. I just I just run the thing ass over tea kettle full speed. It's funny. Uh, it's funny because like it'll report at like forty five hundred RPM. The pump. Like, there's no way it's spinning that fast. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where it gets that number from, but yeah, they're they're cool too. I've taken apart a couple of the pumps, not just from AIOs, but like from my old build. And I was like, I thought it was kind of cool how they do the impellers in them, where there's no physical contact. Yeah. The, the 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 impeller is literally just a magnet with fins on it, and it just oh. sit. Yeah, it's just a ceramic bearing that just sits against the flat surface, and it's using a magnetic current 
to spin it through a solid plastic. So there's there's no physical connection for water, no seal, no O-ring, nothing that water can get through to the motor. No way. So huh. so all you do to clean them out is you just take out the four screws and you separate the case, and it's just this little ceramic like niblet with uh with fins on it that are just sitting in there. And you just take it out and you just clean the whole thing out and put it back together, and you don't have to touch the motor, you don't have to touch any coils. It's it's just hovering. It's it's really really cool. And there's like very very little friction too because. Uh, the, the way it works when you sandwich the two pieces together, there's like a, a tiny little bit of the gap so the thing can like move and fluid can get around it. And where it touches at the bottom is just a tiny little ceramic, like tiny, tiny little ceramic nub that just doesn't wear down. It just, there's no friction because it's not a big enough surface area. Neat. But it's, I, I thought that was kind of cool because I always thought that they had like a shaft going through with like an O-ring and stuff and they could fail and water, that water could leak through there. But no, it's, it's not. The only O-ring in them is where the two halves go together. And the but but it's completely sealed off from all the electronics, so you'd never have to worry about the electronics failing under under heat. Hey, Shika Dance, my man, thank you for that five dollar super chat. He said I played Ultima Online when it came out. I was a player killer. <laughs> Fucking hated you guys. Uh, there's a great free server with old school rules. No care, bear land. Interesting. Especially when, uh, when you're low level. Like, I hated griefers like that who, like, dude, I just started and I'm, like, chopping wood five feet outside of the fucking city gates. And then dude with, like, monster everything would just yep. come swooping through and murder everyone. Dude, it didn't even matter if you were inside of the city gates. They'd come in and gank you and leave before the fucking guards yeah. could get there. Because, like, one thing I liked about Ultima is stuff didn't just magically appear. Like, right. the guards were physical entities in the game, too. So if you waited for the guards to get far enough away, you could run in and rob a bunch of people and leave town before the guards could get to you. Mm -hmm. And Or, like, rob in the bank. Like, there'd be these raids that would come into town, and they'd literally kill everybody at the bank, rob everybody, rob the bank, and it'd be, like, 30 dudes, and the guards would kill, like, 12 of the dudes, and the rest of them would get up, make way with all the loot. I so remember one time in, in EverQuest, uh, this was a story of my dad. My dad and his buddy, uh, I don't know, we'll just call him Frank, um, they actually, in EverQuest, they actually killed all of the NPC guards in, um, in the, this one town, um, for, and held, basically held this entire zone for, like, a couple hours, thinking that, like, the GMs would come and do something special for them and stuff, because there was, like, a, there was, like, a lore story where the, like, the paladins and clerics yep. were, were stuck up in the north part of Freeport, um, because like the Freeport guard were corrupt and stuff. And apparently there's some kind of, you know, friction there. And so he thought like, Oh, uh, since I'm a, since I'm a paladin of the of Freeport, like if I kill all these guards and stuff and, and they, they literally, they had murdered every NPC guard in that zone and held it for, for hours and nothing happened. And I feel like in <laughs> Ultima that would have actually like made a difference. I remember in Ultima, there was a, uh there was a weapon, I think it was called a glass sword, where it would break under one use. Like, you'd hit and it would break, but it did, like, so much damage that you could kill anything in the game, including the guards, except for Lord British. Lord British was the only one, because he had that amulet of restoration or whatever, you couldn't technically kill him. Even if you took all his hit points, he just immediately came back to life. Um, but I remember these glass swords that were in the game, and I remember that there was a bunch of hackers that figured out, because a lot of stuff was client-side back then, right? There was hackers that figured out how to get all these glass swords, so they'd just come into town and they would just kill all the guards with the glass swords, and then they would basically just grief everybody in the town. And the guards would, would come back, like, after you kill the guards, more guards would spawn and, like, come in, but they'd just keep taking these glass swords and just, like, destroying the guards. And, and I remember Ultima had to actually like fix a bug in the game because of that incident, because they literally held one of the towns. Uh, it wasn't Britannia. It was like some other, it was one of, one of the towns in the game, but they completely held the town for like days. That's like, it, man. That's and I was like, that, dude, that kind of thing. it's fucking crazy. My, my favorite story is uh, a griefer that actually, God damn it. I got to pee old man bladder. I'll be right back. I'm going to tell you when I get back though, I'm going to tell you guys a story about how I almost quit Ultima online after being held hostage for a month. Until wow. until they f I finally called uh uh it wasn't EA what was it? who was uh Ultima the the publisher I don't know oh, shit I had to call, I had to call them up I literally as a kid had to call up the publisher and beg them to free me and and I'll tell I'll tell you guys why here it's like I gotta pee really bad though here I'll be, I'll be I'll be right back it's it's a good story though and boy was I pissed. <laughs> oh, it's just the easy name. What up, my nerdy nerds? Hello. 
Come on, come on, Bethesda. Why am why is this so freaking difficult right now? Why you gotta be rude to me? Just trying to log in to fucking Bethesda net. Battle says net. How bad is chat is it's not? Um like it's really not. It's a bunch of hippies who are like it's yeah, it's not it's not bad at all. Sierra. Oh dude. Yeah, Sierra. Any aspirations to visit Australia? I think you'd love it here. Maybe. Uh I'm not against the idea. I request the app. Have you played that? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, Ultima is now is under EA. It wasn't originally. Ever quest the app? Is it? Uh... Is it like an Android app? <laughs> Aussies are owned by China. I'll pass. Okay. Yeah, because China doesn't have trillions of dollars of United States debt. Like, okay, let's not go there. Uh, how long do you they will run the zone? I don't know what that means. Uh, only thing that puts me off Aussie land is all the wired fires trying to kill you. <laughs> all the everything in Australia tries to kill you. Right? Isn't that the isn't that the joke? I might try RuneScape mobile. They don't own half our water. Are you sure? They only just own like half of our real estate. That's you know. Uh, take it all, Android, Apple, and all them that they can put, what? Uh, what? Uh, looks like Jerry's wife, Flutter, Lord, none of this. Ha, <laughs> Uh, Ultima 1 was developed by Origin. Alright. Uh, <laughs> flatten the fan curve, right? That's funny. Uh, old school RuneScape is the best new modern MMO. Right on. Remember when I told Apple was about to? I don't, but I'm not. I wouldn't be surprised if that's true. Honestly. Ah. Uh. You can play EverQuest in all the phone companies, dude. I have to check that out. Were you guys dude. talking shit about my thorn? No. Is that? Yeah. What is that? It's my thorn, bitch. Oh, dude, it looked like a big old gray donger. I swear to God, I thought I thought it was some big floppy wong. You thought I had my big floppy donger in here? It, it did. Uh, when they, uh, maybe it was just bias after they said. Like, no, I keep I keep that shit over on the other side of the room. There it is. For the sore shoulders. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Sometimes some, sometimes I get a a sore uh, a sore member and I need to rub it out. <laughs> no, don't judge me. Oh, gets hey, no, it gets it gets lonely up here, bro. It gets lonely yeah. up here. I don't blame you. All right, so sorry I was gone for a little bit longer than I thought. I decided to take a big old shit while I was downstairs, so came out at light speed. So so it, I guess I'll tell you guys the story about how I got held hostage in Ultima Online. Yeah, Ultima Online. So um, I used to play that game like religiously. Like that was my first real MMO. Like that was the first time I ever had like an online experience. And I played that game for, I want to say, like, two or three years, pretty religiously, like, almost every day. Right. And uh, I was one of those people that always got griefed, right? And I, I deserved it. I would always walk up and taunt people and talk shit to them in the little word bubbles and say inappropriate stuff. Because back then, they never kicked anybody for anything. Right. You could literally walk up to somebody and just be like, fuck you, kill yourself. Ha ha, lols, you're so stupid. I hope you die. You know, and it's like nobody would ever do anything. The GMs in the game would, like, never do anything back then. And so this one dude was like... Uh, He's like, hey, I got a bunch I got a bunch of GP or a, a bunch of gold. Do you want a bunch of gold or something? I was like, hell yeah, I want a bunch of gold. He's like, he's like, follow me. And I'm like, okay, cool. You know, but you can't trust anybody in that game, right? So I'm like on my defense. I got my little sword out. I'm doing my my little my little like dance towards him. Like, oh, I know he's gonna attack me. He's gonna attack me. And he goes and he gets on his ship. Because you could have boats. You could if you're really rich in the game, you could build boats, right? So so he had a boat and he walks me, he gets me to follow him onto the boat, and then he drops a bag of gold. And I'm like, okay, I get on the boat, I grab the gold, and he navigates the boat out one space away from shore. And then he disappears. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, what happened? I'm like, okay, what's going on? So in Ultima, you can't, you can't swim. There's no swimming in Ultima. 
So I'm on a boat and I'm one unit out away from land. So there's no way. So, so it's lifted up the little thing to go to land. So I'm stuck on his boat. So I log out of the game. I log back into the game. I'm on his boat. I log out of the game again. I come back like two hours later. I'm still on his boat. I'm like, what the fuck's going on? So I log out again. I log in again. I'm like, fuck, I'm still on his boat. Because every time you log in, you go back to the place where you left off. And so I'm like still on his boat. This has never happened to me before. This is the first time I've ever been actually trapped by somebody on a boat. And so, so I figured, okay, I'll just wait until the dude comes back. Because he'll be trapped on the boat too, right? So what he did is he logged into the game when I wasn't there, moved the boat one unit close to shore, and then got off the boat, and then put an alt character on the boat, moved the boat out one spot, and then just kept the character logged out forever. There you go. So for about a month, I'd log in every day, and I'd be like screaming. My mom was getting so pissed at me because I'd be like screaming and shit and like, like throwing stuff in my room. I was so mad because I didn't know what to do. Like, I didn't know what to do. You could file a complaint, which I did, like through their, through their stupid little game system, but they never did anything about it. So I remember having to call up the company. Like, I had to actually get the phone number off the box for, for my Ultima 8, because I had Ultima 8, too. I had to get the phone number off Ultima 8 and call tech support for the game and plead with them on the phone. Is like, I want to say at the time I was maybe 10 or 11 years old, maybe like, I think I was about 11, 11 or 12. And I'm pleading with these guys on the phone. I'm like, listen, this guy's holding me hostage on a boat. And the person on the phone just keeps laughing. They're like, oh, my God, oh, like, yeah. like this, is, this is classic. Like, this happens all the time. And so they finally let me off the dude's boat by resetting my character back to a town. So, so then I log into the game and I'm back in the town. So I run back to the boat because I want to see if the boat's still there, right? Because I, I want to like, you know, tell the guy off or whatever. Uh -huh. And uh, so I go back to the boat. The guy isn't there and his boat is like one unit out away from shore. So I go play the game for a while and I'm running around. And then all of a sudden out of the blue, the dude runs up to me and he goes, he goes, hey, you want some gold? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you motherfucker. This has been going on for like four, three, four weeks. And the That's dude comes and finds me again in town. He's like, hey, you want some gold? Follow me. <laughs> and I was like, I was, and I was so mad. I was, I was so livid that this guy was like literally trying to get me to do the same thing that he just held me hostage for like a month. They didn't do anything to him either. He didn't, he didn't get banned. He didn't get reprimanded. Nothing. Huh. So I learned a valuable lesson that day in Ultima was you never board a boat. Unless right. it's your boat, do not board a boat. Like, even, it, it doesn't matter. If it's somebody you think's a friend, don't board a boat. Because you can completely, if you owned a boat in that game, you could hold somebody hostage indefinitely. Huh. And as far as I know, they never fixed that bug. Because, oh. like, if you, you always log in and you always go back to the exact same square where you left. So, so I was literally just, like, held captive on this guy's boat. And he had an alt account that he just didn't use. And he just used that to basically, like, keep the boat one unit out away from land indefinitely. So he would have, unless I, if I didn't call them, that account would have been dead. Like, oh. there's no way for me to get off that boat. I could, I could lodge GMs. I could go into the general chat and be like, general manager, I'm stuck on a boat. I'm stuck on a boat. And they would just completely ignore me. Like, what a dumbass. Like, you know. It was, just, it was the stupidest thing that's ever happened in an MMO. But, man, I was so mad. And they didn't even refund me for the month either. Because, like, you know, you had to pay. It was a monthly fee. And they didn't even refund me for the month that I was literally held hostage by a dude in that game. That's and nice. and I always had the people that would just chase me forever. Like, every once in a while, you'd have a guy that literally wanted to kill you so bad for whatever reason that you could literally run from one end of the map to the other with them literally, like, two units behind you, full trot. Mashing on the keyboard, mashing on the keyboard, get to the other side, run up, run up three units and start running back the other direction. And they would not break off pursuit. They would just chase you endlessly for hours and hours and hours until you finally gave up. And then as soon as you try to log out of the game, there's like a little cooldown time. And then they just run over and gank you and kill you and take all your shit. And that used oh. to happen to me all the time. And then you'd run into a town and it wouldn't do you any good. Because if you ran into a town and you stopped, they would still one hit kill you before the guards could get them. Wow. So you basically had nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. But that's kind of the reason why I like that game is like anything went right it was it was very realistic in that case that it's like yeah if somebody really wanted to kill you and they had the mechanism they didn't care about paying the price they'd do it they'd totally do it uh chicken dance thank you the five dollars said i played ultima online when it came out i was a player killer oh i read that one earlier uh let's see here oh he, there's a new message he said i'm sorry for killing you on ultima i have changed ultima was created by origin that's right it was origin my God, though. But I remember I didn't even know how to, like, I didn't even have a number to call for Ultima Online, so I literally had to call the phone number on the back of the Ultima 8 box. Which, by the way, Ultima, Ultima 8 was, eh. Ultima 6 was my favorite Ultima. Out of all the Ultima games, Ultima 6 was my favorite. I don't think I played any of the other, like, other than Ultima Online, I don't think I played any of the Ultima games. Ultima 6 was, like, there was absolutely no rules at all. Like, you could do, like, the most twisted shit. You could literally go kill children in their bed, put them in your backpack, take them to the pub, and cook them in the fireplace in front of everybody. Like, that's, that's how bad of a game it was. Like, and, and so, 
there, because there was just no logic in the game to tell you you couldn't do anything. Like you could literally like just go kill rabbits and and like rip their you know rip their heads off or whatever and just take them to the pub and like put them on the counter next to people that are drinking. So uh, <laughs> or, or like Lord British, I actually killed Lord British, but he immediately comes back to life and then kills you. But in Ultima Six, the way that you had to kill Lord British because he had so many hit points, you had to go move the cannons. Like you'd go around, Brit- you know, the castle of Britannia. Ooh, okay. You'd have to go get all the cannons and move them one unit at a time, one by one space. It took hours, and you'd move them into his bedchamber. And at a certain time of the day, he'd go to sleep. He'd go to his bedchamber and he'd go to sleep. And you'd surround his entire bed with powder kegs and and uh, cannons. <laughs> and you'd fire the cannon, and it would go pew 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 for like five minutes. Pew, 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 pew. And then Lord British would be like, Ugh, he's dead. And then he'd immediately be back to life and he'd just be like running around his room like, who killed me? Who killed me? But he didn't know you were the one that initiated the attack. So as long as you didn't attack him after that, he like wouldn't know. He'd just run around like all getting all antsy because he was attacked. Yeah. So there's there a lot of fun stuff that you could do in Ultima. I felt like Ultima Online was more like Ultima 6 than Ultima 8, though. <laughs> Ultima 8 was weird because it ran like shit on like everybody's computer. I don't know anybody that actually had a good Ultima 8 experience when it came out because the graphics were just like too hardcore for present day hardware. Let's see what else. Uh, what else do we want to talk about? So we think Apple might be going to ARM. We talked about yeah. that, which would be. I mean that that that's going to kick Intel like right in the in the nudicles yeah. because they sell a lot of lot of processors that way. I still think a lot of Intel's Intel's main jam is still like server stuff. So I think they'll be all right. The the heavy iron enterprise level, you don't you don't see like their more visible face is like their yeah. consumer stuff, the i the i five, i seven, i nine stuff, but really, really it's I feel like their big their big money comes from like custom chips for internal stuff and, and secret or not secret but like corporate level, you know, uh custom chip work and uh and heavy iron server stuff. Do beyond f- Xeon stuff. Beyond like Yeah. Z- do you f- do you feel like AMD's like properly handing their ass to them right now? Oh, for sure. On the consumer side, yeah. yeah especially this this latest generation, just was was really what need what Intel needed to kick in the butt for sure. Yeah, yeah. I don't understand how AMD. Okay, so so AMD the under the un, always notorious underdog, right? Oh, for sure. Like e- even just production number wise and everything. How the hell did they get the seven nanometer before Intel and Intel still isn't there? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, and, and Intel still doesn't support PCI 4.0, right? Even does their right. new generation finally support it? Not until I think uh, I've I want to say I've heard or seen some talk about later in the year, um, like November holiday season ish. Uh, but uh, that is, I could not tell you where that's coming from. Um, that's pure pure rumor and speculation. I, I'm not. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> That's weird, man. It's it's weird to see AMD like handing them such a proper ass kicking, seeing just the sheer size of the companies. Super weird. Intel uh, earlier this year or late last year talked about their new Optane PCIe SSD, right? Yeah, PCIe four, and they don't they don't even have a motherboard that out. Or you know, there there is no Intel PCIe four point but you put out a. So literally, they're advertising a product that would only work on AMD right now. Have to use AMD <laughs> platform for, and I'm like, what? That just shows like, oh my the, god, this is just a disconnect. Like, they'd be oh. like Nvidia making a graphics card and being like, oh, it gets you, it gets you extra performance if you run an AMD CPU. Yeah, like their competitor. Yeah. Weird. It, it, it seems very strange. Um, this just a weird disconnect from Intel's internal workings. I don't know. I just wonder di- if AMD. I hope AMD doesn't get complacent though. I hope that AMD keeps the pressure oh. on hard because. Yeah, I don't think they will. Um, what's going to be tough, I think, is is coming back or, or is is fighting the GPU side. Um, I feel like um, absorbing ATI all those years ago in the long run has hurt uh, the graphics card industry uh, because now it seems at least that they're splitting resources. Like, okay, yeah, you guys have been doing great in the last five, six years yeah. um, on the CPU side, but you guys are still slagging really bad on, on the graphics card side. Like, it's, I don't know. It's just weird. I don't know. I'll be honest. We'll I don't. I don't hear a lot about AM, like AMD graphics cards. I, really, I know. I know that there's people that are just ride or die with them. But Nvidia is the sure. one that I still hear like primarily when it comes to graphics cards and performance. Unless it's a console chip, it's yeah. it's everything's Nvidia. So, my mind, by the way, like 
holy cow. Okay, so the Unreal Engine 5 demo, apparently, if I remember correctly, was being shown on a PlayStation 5, which is an AMD APU. Correct. They're not even a discrete graphics card. And holy cow, that's gorgeous. What's the deal with the PC side? Like, what's going on? Why do your graphics cards not compete at the same level as NVIDIA when your console stuff looks to be at least current gen equivalent? Like, what is going on? I don't know. And this is my own ignorance. Like, I'm not trying to criticize. I think a lot of it comes to optimization. Oh, like, whoa. Yeah. I, th I think a lot of it just comes down to optimization. You have a platform with like a bes bespoke CPU, a bespoke GPU. They're built on a bus that communicate with each other on a level that PC just isn't capable of. Like, yeah. like it's it's a unique, distinct architecture, and and everything, every piece of code from the ground up is written to optimize a, a single process running, like uh -huh. taking over everything. Uh -huh. And so that that that's why I think that like consoles have always been like that too. Like even stuff like the Xbox 360, its graphics capabilities compared to a similar equipped PC. Oh. We're, we're always better. The graphics always oh, look yeah, better just amazing. because it was optimized, right? So, but it does, yeah. it does kind of blow my mind, though, that, like, I, I can't wait for Unreal 5, though, because I think Unreal 5 is, is where they're, they're showing us on the consoles that what AMD is capable of. Think of what RTX will be capable of. That's what I mean. Yeah, that right? Like, what Control, I think Control, the PC game Control, was, mm -hmm. I've heard, I haven't played it myself, and I don't have an RTX graphics card, but I've heard, like, that is a prime example of what like ray tracing is capable of uh as far as like yeah and that and like what the new minecraft rtx i think is is oh man that is fucking mind-blowing but it's crazy and i don't I, and yeah i think you're right it is it is the fact that it's a it, they only have to focus on one set of hardware it's not oh there's 17 graphics cards we have to try right and work and you know all these different adjustment settings for graphics textures and this and that and all that it's it's this is what we have for hardware this is what we have for and then the developers have to work within those constraints and they can and they can highly optimize their games for that one set of of hardware yeah renee said the gpu for the ps5 is based on the rdna2 for navi which isn't even out for pc yet yeah, so it's their next big, generation hardware that's the next step is that big big navi stuff and and hey you know what i hope Hope, 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 hope that AMD has a, a, a launch, has a release, a product soon that competes, even if it's just, even if it's at the mid tier NVIDIA at a comparable price. If they can get like 1070 or 2070 as their flagship, even if they can hit that high mid range um market like that 300 to 400 dollar graphics yep. card and it, it is comparable to nvidia that'd be great that's a that's a huge step uh, and which would be super awesome uh syntexify said the rdna2 pc cards will be out uh before the consoles are released you know i'm i I'd, I'd hope that that would be the case but the other reason why i think that might not be the case is think about the exclusivity of how having that chipset in a console for a period of time exclusively ah. i mean if you were if you were bidding for a gpu for your console and I do believe that both uh, uh, both the Microsoft console and the Sony console both use an AMD chipset, if I'm not oh. mistaken. So yeah. my yeah. guess is that one of the stipula I, I'd be surprised if one of the stipulations of that wasn't that they got exclusivity over that graphics chipset for at least a period of time. Because if PC releases a graphics card that gives it the same exact capabilities in uh, uh, under Unreal 5, for instance, to get a better performance, better experience on PC than the console, then I think you're going to lose a lot of those console sales to people that are PC gamers that, right. that would have would have bought the console literally just to get early access to that level and graphics capability. Um, but I'm curious to see. I mean, I, I think honestly, if they did release a card for the PC beforehand, I think that it'd be okay to compete as long as it was at a price point that put it outside the grasp of the console price. Like if, right. if the graphics card was cheaper than the console, then the PC guys are just going to buy the graphics card to get on par right. graphics with the console. Um, unless they want just the exclusives. But if it's outside of that price and say they price the graphics card at like seven, eight hundred, nine hundred bucks to get that same performance, then people are going to want to buy the console, which they're already selling at a loss. Every console that has been made in modern history has sold at a loss um, because they, they recoup their money on the games. Right. So selling the games oh, yeah. and selling the software because it's not an operating system. You know, it's not a desktop operating system. So so you have to buy the games and and piracy is a really difficult thing to do on those modern platforms. So what they what they usually try to do is just lose like 300 bucks, you know, on each console two three hundred dollars on each console and then just make it back on sales. 
So I had to highly doubt that if the graphics card dropped at the same time, that it would be cheaper than the entire console with the same graphics chipset. But we will see. Time will tell. Yeah. The games uh, are the money makers. Yep. Always the software. The software has always been the money side of consoles. Uh, as a matter of fact, X, I think the record was Xbox 360. I believe mm-hmm. the Xbox 360 sold at a $200 loss. Like every unit they sold, they lost $200. On that thing, and I don't think it became profitable until its third year. So Microsoft, oh, nice. for three years, they sold a console at a loss. And Sony, Sony will do it too. Sony will come out with a console and sell it at a loss, but like maybe for like six months, and right. then they ramp up production to where they break even or they make a little bit of money. Microsoft was like they wanted to beat Sony so bad. They wanted to cream was the PlayStation Four, I think is what they were. No, PlayStation Three. It was PlayStation Three versus Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty. They wanted to cream it so bad. That they were like, we're just going to lose our ass on like every console sold just to get in the same the same price category, and not many companies have the resources to be able to do something like that. Renee said uh, both PS Five and Xbox One Series X use AMD Ryzen CPUs and Navi GPUs, but the MS One has chosen higher clocks on the CPU than the Sony has on the PS Five. I'd imagine that's probably from a heat dissipation standpoint, or maybe they're pushing other components on the system faster, because I do know that the PlayStation 5 has faster I.O. Like, the PlayStation 5 has significantly faster I.O. As a matter of fact, they have a, a, a NAND, was it like a NAND-based storage device that's capable of, I think, almost twice the speed of the Xbox. So literally, games are going to load so much faster, but it also means less storage. Because, you know, of course, it's like 800 gigabytes instead of a terabyte like it will be on the Xbox Series X. Um, but it's way faster. The storage is way faster. And if you've ever gone from like a spinning disk to SSD, oh, you know dude. you know how much of a difference that is in the overall um, experience of playing a wow. game when loading times get cut down like that. Oh, my God. So I, so I really think that they made the right decision if getting that extra I.O. came at the cost of like slowing down a couple of other things. And they're huh. just going to optimize it out anyways. Like, look at the PlayStation 3, man. You play like Gran Turismo. Uh, Gran Turismo Sport on the on the PlayStation, uh, it's the yeah. PlayStation Three. Yeah, it looks fantastic for the generation of console it is. It even does like 1080 60, which wasn't even possible when the console shipped. Let's see what else we got going on up here. Shikadan yeah, said, "Is the PS Five going to be backwards compatible?" That's a good question. I'd imagine it would be. I thought I thought I saw that it was going to be. Because honestly, I mean, historically, they've always had some yeah. kind of backwards compatibility. I mean, uh, at least to the Euro, previous generation. Eurogamer is saying that PS5 will support backwards compatibility with seemingly all PS4 games due to it being based in part on the PS4's architecture. Um, it says Sony has said that the majority of the top 100 most played games are working, so expect support for the biggest PS4 titles at launch. Yeah, it's, it's not confirmed, but it said that even Sony filed a patent that clearly shows that their PS5 will have backwards compatibility. Here's the thing. The PlayStation 5 is so fast, just in pure flops and graphical capability, that even if they had to emulate the PlayStation 4, they'd be able to do it. Right. Like, like even if it was software emulation of the PlayStation 4, they, they, it'd literally be just as fast, if not faster, than the PlayStation 4 itself. So, and, and they have all the software to do that, right? That, that's not a hard thing for them to do to emulate their own platform because they already have all the code to do it. No. It just it it literally be as simple as them basically building an emulator that runs the operating system from the PlayStation Four right on top, just like I believe Xbox did the same thing. Like Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty, I think used emulation to play um, the original Xbox games, and that that's sense. why not. That's why they had to take forever before yeah. every month, or so there'd be new titles that were compatible. Yeah, and not every game worked either. That was the other thing that was a clear giveaway that it was emulation is that like they added more and more games that would work with it. As yeah. time went on, and if it and if it was an actual hardware emulation, like if they actually had the hardware in there that was capable of running it verbatim, then they wouldn't just have like some things working and other things not. It's it's usually a telltale sign of of emulation when you have some games that work and some games that don't, because usually there's clever things the developers do to optimize a game that right. wouldn't come through properly in emulation, but on the bare hardware actually work perfectly. Hey, Mike, thank you the five dollars. You see, I think the new consoles are so unnecessarily chunk and alien looking. That's my biggest complaint with them, honestly. Taking up way too much space. What do you think? I think they're both ugly. I don't know. The space thing, like, I don't know. Uh, my brother's got a PS4, and uh, it seems to take up as much space as it needs to. Like, uh, I mean. <laughs> it fits It fits in an entertainment center, though. The PlayStation yeah. 4, like, it fits. And it, it doesn't look like the experience music project, like, puked all over your entertainment center. Yeah. I do, I do think the newer one, I hope it comes in black. 
I think I think if they only have a white option, yeah, that's gonna keep people from buying it. Dude, those honestly. white controllers will literally look like just black fingered bung Cheeto just dust. Like weird. it'll be gross. I don't. I I think it's cool that they showcase a white one. It looks super neat, awesome, right on. I love all the jokes about it looking like a router or whatever. Fine, it does it's actually cool. look like a router. But if they don't do a, it seems weird to me if they don't do a black one. The PS2, the PS3, the PS4, yeah, all black. And it and it makes sense as a just a universal like fits into anybody's decor. It disappears yeah. into your entertainment system sort of thing. If you only do a white one, people are gonna freak. Yeah. Plus, I mean, they're just they're just plastic coverings too. So like, how hard would it be for them to just make different colored panels? Like, it doesn't. They don't even have to alter any other design component. Like, just put black panels. The rest of it's black. So just put a black panel on both sides of it, and boom, you've got yourself. Uh, I, well, if they don't, if I, I'm not going to get either console. I'm going to try to avoid it, but something tells me that there's going to be some exclusive game that I have to play that'll cause me to cave on one or the other. Um, like if the PlayStation 5 comes out and we find out that one of the launch titles is like Gran Turismo 6 or something like that, or like, you know, it's like the next generation racing game, then I'm going to be like, okay, fuck it. I got to, I have to buy it. But, but other than that, I'm going to try to stick to just PC gaming. But if I did have to buy one and it only came in white, I would literally, the first thing I'd do is buy vinyl, black vinyl and like refinish it. Like I'd get oh, yeah. matte vinyl and like refinish the controller and refinish the console because yeah. The white will get so dirty. Everything I own that's that, that's white just gets like filthy dirty in this house with dust settling on it. Uh, finger bung shows up on it. Like if you ever had a white controller before, it gets oh, yeah. like this nasty brown. Like you get brown like dead skin lines and stuff yeah. like around where your thumbs are. It's just nasty. I, I think they just did that because it's like white made it pop, right? If it was black, you wouldn't be able to see the angles as much. Right. So so it's like more just to show it off, and then when it ships, they'll really probably do. have different colors. Yeah, I really do think it was just to show. Just uh, they'll they will have a white one, sure, but I I think yeah, it was just for for looks, just to show it off. <laughs> Rene, Rene said D brand probably D brand already has a skin for it. <laughs> oh, I believe it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, D D brand's on top of that shit, right? They already wait, wait. They already pre previewed Gran Turismo Seven on PS Five. No, they did not. Whoa. No, hold up, hold up. I have not been interested in PS Five, but if Gran Turismo is involved, I'm totally all over that. Oh man! Oh man! I just got done telling everybody I was gonna buy a PlayStation Five, but if Gran Tur because Gran Turismo won't come out for PC. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see what we got here. Okay, so Gran Turismo Seven. Oh my God! What? What? Okay, I gotta watch this. I gotta watch this. Here, let me let me see if I can bring this up on the screen. This is I I did not know this was a thing until you said something. Thank thank you, chat. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, here, let me see. How do I shit? Well, I gotta I gotta figure out how to do my my little voodoo fuckery here so that people can see what I'm what I'm trying to do. Here, open up my OBS, move it over here, and make this full screen. And then make this full screen. Close the porn tabs. Oops. Demonetized. Oops. Uh, why was this why will this not go full screen? Oh, it's because it's in Bing. Hold on. Hey. Oh my god. This, this I, I have to watch this with you guys because this is like, oh my god, this is this is like moaner worthy right here. All right, here we go. Let's see. Can you guys see it? Nope. Alright, here we go. Here we go. Get ready for it. Uh, 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 <laughs> womp -tsh, womp -tsh. I have to listen to it muted, or I have to watch it muted. <laughs> just keep, just keep giving us sound effects. Now for PlayStation 5. 
Welcome to GT Town. I'm Sarah, your tour guide. First. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. That was awesome. We're all on scene. Let's fast forward a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so oh, Alex, dude. There's some gameplay video, too. By the way. As far as I know, the whole PlayStation 5 reveal, uh, everything everything that they showed was um, was all uh, like on uh, PlayStation. Uh, I, I remember that being a thing. You know what? Just looking at this, though, like now, Gran Turismo is kind of a different game. You can't really compare it to like Forza Motorsport and stuff. But uh, uh, they were like direct competitors as yeah. far as like full simulation driving. Gran Turismo has always been considered the the more realistic simulator. Like even Gran Turismo Five was, or I guess you'd call it Gran Turismo Six, right? The the one last one for the PlayStation Four. Yeah. Um, it, the physics in it, the driving physics and everything, are usually like recognized by like leagues as better than Forza. Like Forza has always been like more of an arcade racer, even though I love it. Yeah. Forza is like one of my all time favorite games, like easily uh, to play on the consoles, but. Oh my god, man. This is... I did not know this was coming. I have not been paying that close attention to anything. But this is a game changer for me, so I changed everything I just said. Yep. I will be buying. If I can find one, granted, because I think everybody's going to buy them and scalp them on eBay for the first year. Oh, of uh, course. But if I can somehow get my hands on one of these, I absolutely do want a PlayStation 5 just for Gran Turismo. Because Gran Turismo will never come out on PC. It, it won't. Yeah. It'll, it'll never come out on PC, so it just it, it makes sense to have the console for that. Plus, I have a Thrustmaster T300RS, which is the wheel that is licensed and works with the PlayStation 4, so hopefully it works with the PlayStation 5, which means I'll have, like, full-blown good force feedback and all that all that good stuff. Did, did, either, did either Gran Turismo or Forza ever actually come out on PC? Yes, yes. Forza, uh, Forza Motorsport 7 and Forza Horizon 4 are PC titles. Like, you can okay. play them on PC also. And man, do they look so much better. Like, like if you look at it on the, well, obviously with modern hardware and everything, but you can enable right. HDR, uh, HDR, 4K, 60 plus frames per second. You can enable all the graphic stuff that's not available on the Xbox. And you look at them side by side and it's like, it's an insanely better graphics experience. Like I would even say that Forza Motorsport 7 on PC maxed out graphics looks better than that demo of Gran Turismo 7. <laughs> so, but I still need Gran Turismo because it's, it's Gran Turismo, dude. It's like the online play and the community and Gran Turismo has always been like way less of a griefer community and take it way more seriously than the Forza guys. Ah. But I like Forza. For Forza is still good. Uh, let's see here. Dreamer said, can game developers be capable of raise the CPU and GPU clock for their game, or is it capped? Oh, it's capped. They're not going to allow the, the software manufacturers to fuck with machine no. capability. Yeah, uh, no way. So, and, and they're going to, and it's a walled garden like you, like you wouldn't believe. I mean, it's, all gaming consoles are. Yeah, there's no way they're going to allow game developer to have low level control. It'd be, it's just, it'd be too crazy. Plus, like, yeah, it would just they have to they have to keep the the hardware locked to a specific yeah. set. Otherwise, you'd get all the same problems you start getting with PCs. Oh, hey, I if I bump my GTA 5 on my Xbox to, you know, <laughs> yep. 8.7, I can get better blah blah blah. And then your shit crashes and then they're calling up support saying, "Oh, Microsoft sucks because my Xbox died because I overclocked my blah blah blah." No. <laughs> to allow yeah. that, that level of control just in, inputs so much more problems. Dude, I cannot believe the Grand... I, how did I miss that Gran Turismo 7? I mean, was that just recently announced, or is that... Have people? No, that was part of... That, that video you were showing was yeah. part of the PS5 announcement. Oh, that just happened, right? Like, yeah, that was just... Okay. So I don't feel so stupid now, because I honestly didn't hear anything. I didn't I didn't know a PS... I, I didn't know they were going to do another Gran Turismo. I was just joking when I was like, oh my god, if it comes out with a Gran Turismo, but... They just sold me. Like, I will literally spend $500 million on that console to get Gran Turismo. Done. And that's it. just done. It's going to be in my house. Uh, Renee S. S said, not true. PS5 supports different speeds. Uh, really? What do you mean, Renee? Like, you're overclocking your PlayStation inside of the video game? E I, I am going to we say... Like a throttling we're, we're, yeah, we're not saying that the PlayStation itself can't change its own clock speed. We're just saying the game itself, the game itself should not be able to modify the system clock. Yeah, like it, it only has so much to give. It's not going to give you any more that it can give. You can't just like go in and say, "Oh, I want it to run at a faster speed." I could see, I could see where the the like whatever the OS would um, like boost or throttle depending on what the game is trying to accomplish. Yeah, we're not talking about like boost clock. Like we're not we're not talking about that. It would it just it wouldn't be in the hands of the developer. It would be a it would basically be like an operating system level sort of thing where. 
Um, really, the developers can control the speed of the CPU for boosting? Really? That's interesting. I'd have, I'd have to see that one to believe it because that seems Which, really, okay. really dangerous. Benefit, benefit of the doubt. Okay, but even if, even if they have that control, it's still going to be somewhat limited. Uh, there's like there's no way they're going to be able to push the system beyond uh, what Sony and or Microsoft like lay out. Like they're they're they would only they could. There's just no way you'd be able to. I feel in uh, again this is opinion. I don't think they would allow the software developers to push the hardware beyond a certain spec. Like yes, okay, we're gonna let you play with some some of this, but you're only be able to go up to within a certain limit. Yeah, okay, within within the limits of what Sony is defined, which makes sense because again, consoles have to have a there's an expectation of stability. Like how I don't know about you, Jerry, but I don't think I've ever come across a single time where a, a game a console game has like, crashed. Like I've 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 soft locked and hard locked a few times, but like. Where where it's just dumped me to desktop essentially. I don't think I've ever encountered that outside of an Xbox. I agree. Oh, sure. <laughs> hey, hey, X- Xbox still. I've just had I've just had like Forza just like stop working. All of a sudden you're at the yeah. main menu again. You're like, what happened? Now that you mention it, I did have a couple times where 360 would just. I'm trying to figure out the only thing that I can think of, and and again, I'm gonna have to look into this now that Renee talked about this. The only the only thing that I could think why they would give the developer access to clock things is at the expense of another thing. Because you can only have a maximum, uh, you can only have a maximum power consumption and heat distribution, right? So maybe they're given access to the developer to say, "I want to squeeze more out of the graphics card at the expense of taking less from the CPU," or vice versa, to a certain point, to a certain threshold. But because if if that wasn't the case, why wouldn't you just run everything at a hundred percent all the time if you're the developer? If I was the developer and it's guaranteed to be stable, like nobody's going to buy my game because it uses like twenty five watts less power. Like nobody gives a shit. Like I would just <laughs> crank the thing to the max. Like hey. Lower your lower your electric bill by playing. Yeah, so, so I'm jungle. betting it's more of an optimization thing where it's like the developer gets to balance between how much CPU and GPU they want to use, or how GPU heavy or how CPU heavy they want to be, and you know taking away from one to give to another. More more of a balance, right? That's controlled through the software. I can't see them just like unlocking it and allowing you to just like push the thing beyond a hundred percent, like in yeah, both categories. No, it it definitely has to be within a certain. Yeah, I'm curious though. I mean, that's an interesting way to do it because. I mean, they need to do it in a uniform way across all consoles, and it needs to be capable across all consoles, right? Because yeah. otherwise, you don't have a uniform experience, and that's the one thing consoles have to have is a uniform experience. Right. Hey, Jazz Wolf, thank you for the five dollars. Said, "Oh, great! Patreon prices are going up. Jerry needs a PS5." <laughs> 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 I should, yeah. As of today, all tier ones are now a hundred dollars a month. It'll, it's worth <laughs> it. It's totally worth it. You guys will be okay. I'm just kidding. Uh, it's funny, Patreon keeps messaging me and telling me to up my rates, and I'm like, no, fuck you. I think it's because they're trying to make it impossible to have a $1 tier anymore, and so they, if they can get enough people to like switch off of it, then then they won't allow any new people to do it. So I'm like, no, screw you guys. $1. $1 for life until they force to, me to do otherwise. I did I did start a Patreon account. I just don't I don't think I have... Uh, I didn't put anything on it or, or anything. Basically. You gotta put, You gotta post those like toilet vlogs, dude. That's what I do. Yeah. Like I've got I've got over two hundred vlogs on Patreon that you can only was, watch for a dollar a month. I was thinking of doing just like, like these short like, um, it, it started with the idea on TikTok, right? Um, which hey man, it's it's a new platform. Why not try it out? But uh, where it's like one minute, like these one minute food reviews, basically like my junk food journal, and uh, you know just real quick. Hey man, I'm eating these chips. They suck. Don't eat them. They or like, man, I love this. I just made these chicken wings or whatever. Just real quick, one like little one minute food reviews. <laughs> I thought would be fun. I I'd watch those. I totally yeah. would. Yeah, I just try my what I what I do mostly on Patreon is I try to post these jitter episodes about every three or four days. I'll do an like a half an hour to an hour episode. Yeah. It's just just talking about everything, basically just summing up the last couple of days and like what's going on. And I usually get a little bit more down and dirty and gritty and a little bit more personal than I would in any public forum. Um, like like last night, uh, me and Miss Barnacles had a talk about uh, creating an, her, her creating an OnlyFans and me creating an OnlyFans account to make more <laughs> money if everything goes to hell in a handbasket. And we just got to find a way to survive. And uh, so that's like the first like 15 minutes of the vlog is just us talking about that potential. That's and, and, and I'm not going to tell you which way it goes because you got to pay your dollar if you want to figure it out. Um, but, yeah, no, Patreon's actually been really good. Like, I, I, I don't like... This is the thing is, like, I, I love that it gives me a platform to interact with a smaller group of people that are, like, more invested in, like, my personal yeah. side of things. Um, but at the same time, Patreon, they need to be a better platform. 
They certainly do. For, for the amount of money that they take, they certainly do not put in the effort. There is so much low-hanging fruit bugs, and their UI sucks, and half the people I post the vlogs for, like, message me, and they're like, oh, when's the new vlog coming out? And it's like, dude, it's been out for, like, two days. Like, you, you didn't get the notice and email? Um, that kind of stuff I don't like. But for the people that sit there on Patreon and, like, check it out every couple of days and stuff like that, it's really cool. It's really yeah. cool. Huh. Uh... Let's see. What do we got here? We're uh, we're about to wrap up, too, guys. About 10 minutes oh, left yeah. if you guys have any final messages for us. Go, go, go. Go, go, go. It's the speed round. I, like uh, I have a Sound Blaster AE9 sound card and absolutely love it. I love to hear you guys' opinion on that sound card. I've never used it. Uh, dude, I haven't had a, a dedicated sound card since my Sound Blaster Autogy Gamer 2. Which would have been in about 2000. I think I probably bought it in 2002, um, but I kept it until I gave away that. That was an Athlon. What? Dude, that dated it. When you said Athlon, that dated it big time. It was a, yeah, it was an Athlon XP2 CPU. Um, this was still XP days when XP was at, the, at their peak. Yeah. Windows XP, I mean. Uh, so yeah, I, I haven't, in fact, I almost thought I had to get like a cheese ball USB, uh, sound card interface thing to make this whole mixer thing work the way I wanted it to. Yeah. Huh. Sound cards used to be like important, but they're not anymore. Yeah. Like, like onboard audio now, like the problem was like you needed a sound card cause onboard audio sucked or it was non-existent. Now yeah. every motherboard ships with like a 5.1 or a 7.1 Dolby certified <laughs> chip. That, and, and it doesn't take away from your frame rate or anything like that because it's like your computers are so fast you don't even notice even if it is a software processor. Um, however, my last sound card had a purpose. It was a Asus Zonar, and this would have been about four or five years ago. That was the last. I still have it somewhere around here. It's sitting on a shelf. And the reason I had it was because it had uh, uh, the, the quarter-inch the quarter inch jacks for like professional headphones, and they could drive a 600-ohm headphone. And they had op amps that you could change out on them and stuff. So they were basically, it was the sound card equivalent of having like a dedicated external DAC, like, wow. like, like a tube based DAC. And, and it yeah. sounded absolutely amazing. It threw crazy volume and everything, but I got rid of it when I went to, when I went to the Yamaha mixer, because when I went to the Yamaha mixer, this one actually has more capability than the Zonar in the card that's built into it. And it doesn't take up a slot in the PC. And the Zonar also required external power. You literally had, just like your graphics card, you had to plug in an extra, like, Molex power connector into it. Huh. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, I don't think sound cards are really a necessity anymore. Um, I prefer to use, like, a, U a USB sound card just because it's one less thing taking up a slot and generating heat inside of the computer. And they're all super capable now. Like, the external sound cards are, are massively capable. They usually have more room so they can have more amp components on them and more heat spread so they're not burning out. Uh, they don't have to be shielded. You don't have to have that crazy shielding around. Like my Zonar had like this giant metal plate that ran the full length of it, so it wouldn't pick up EM yeah. and, and transfer it. So that that's the way that's the way I look at it. It's just like sound cards. I think are kind of a dead a dead technology for the most outside part. Of, outside of like maybe professional, like I could see where like you know you need a, a, a separate audio processing sort of card for like uh, lots of inputs or some sort of. I don't, uh, uh, I'm not a big audio geek, but I can see. Yeah, sure. You get a mixer. And, and, and <laughs> audio sure. Um, I'm like, I can yeah. fit a hell of a lot more ports on that than I can some <laughs> sticking out of the back of a PCI slot. Right. So I, I do think there is, uh, I'm sure there is some application out there where somebody finds it necessary. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I know, I mean, creative labs obviously keeps making them. So people are buying them. Yeah. Um, and I mean, if you're hardcore, it, it, like the last uh, hurrah that I saw for sound cards was when they were doing the hardware accelerated stuff. Like the Sound Blaster Audigy had like a, an accelerated engine on it where if the game supported it, it basically could talk to the sound card like direct direct audio. And But now everything does that. Like everything does that now. And so, you know, you don't have to worry about your sound card like eating into your frame rate if you up to like 96 kilohertz or something that you can't even notice the difference anyways. Um but I mean, teach their own, right? I mean, if you're, but I'll tell, I'll tell you this. Okay. If you're an audiophile, you don't give a shit about a sound card, you know? And I mean that like in the, in the context of a PCI card that you're sitting into your system, because no self-respecting audiophile would ever want their signal to come from something within a box full of electromagnetic signals. They, oh, they would sure. want that shit outside the box, magnetically shielded, uh, isolated with its own, uh, its own independent ground like most external like audiophile level DACs have, right? Like even my uh, 
my O2 amp that I have, which is an open source audio file grade headphone amplifier. Even that has a place where you can put a dedicated ground on it, actually ground it right to earth just to get rid of any, you know, hum that's on some spectrum that you couldn't even hear if you wanted to. Wow. Hey, Chicken Dance, thank you for the $2, said, are you doing coffee chat today? Um, no, today is, this is my only stream today because I already did a lengthy stream yesterday. And, uh, but tomorrow, tomorrow I'll probably be streaming in the afternoon. So around 3 p.m. over on Twitch. What other questions we got coming in here? Uh, let's see here. What's a request for microphone recommendations? Somebody wants to upgrade from their Yeti. Ooh, why don't you tell yeah. them about your Yeti upgrade experience? By the way, we need to get you a pop filter, though. Yeah, that's what I, I keep hearing. I, I I hear really sharp S. S it, 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 like, like literally just say pop into the microphone. Pop. Yeah, pop. pop, pop. It's, it, this is what it sounds like. It sounds like pop, 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 pop. You got to have the pop, 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 pop. Um, Need one if of you're these. looking to stay with USB, um, honestly, the Yeti is fine. I don't know why you would want to upgrade. The the next step after that, really, um, I'll fold your beard upwards. Sure, yeah, that might work. Pop, 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 pop. pop. It actually does. <laughs> <laughs> you got a built-in pop. You should do that in the next one. Just fold it up and put like a rubber band around it. Built-in <laughs> pop filter. Uh, I would I would say that the next step after a, a decent USB mic like a yeti or, or there's a there's a few others that are pretty good um you're gonna you're starting to get into xlr mics and um you'll need a mixer for that or or a, some sort of audio interface i should yeah. say yeah you don't necessarily need a mixer you will need an audio interface uh something like the scarlet uh focus right 2i2 which will just plug right in and then that goes straight into your your computer via usb or you'll bump up to a mixer like jerry and i have done and at that point, there's depends on how much you want to spend. Uh, you don't. You really, really don't need to drop the money on an SM7B. That's like a no. four hundred dollar, four fifty, four hundred. It's just for the mic, great. and then you need a cloud lifter and a phantom power yeah. source for it. And it's like, yeah, by the time you're done, you're like eight hundred dollars into that damn thing. Yeah, that's for like super professional podcasting. A lot of radio studios have those and stuff. But uh, uh, at home, you do not need an SM7B. And it'll literally yeah. sound like five percent better than this. It's like super diminishing returns when you get up into that money. Yeah. Dude, you can spend a hundred dollars, a hundred, a hundred dollars on an AT2020. On a decent and another hundred dollars on a mixer audio interface like this Behringer cost me one hundred and eighteen dollars, which was more more than I needed to pay for it. Honestly, you could probably get a good deal on this eighty bucks, maybe yeah, hundred bucks. Um, but the what I find what I've in my researching, if if Jerry hadn't given me this AT twenty fifty, I would have I would have uh, went with the NT one that which is what Jerry has right now. Um, that, that kit brand new, that kit will run you like 200 or 220. Um, make sure you don't get the USB one. Um, just you pay attention to what you're doing. Um, but dude, there's, there's a whole, once you start getting into XLR mics, there's a whole range. There's, you can get condensers or, or what's the other one? Um, Shit, there's so many of them like dy dynamic, uh, dynamic and condensers. There's, there's the one that sounds like this. <laughs> <laughs> there's the, <laughs> <Not that one. laughs> But yeah, no, no. Um, there's like three major. There's three major types. There's the the sure is a uh, dynamic, where yeah, basically it doesn't use any power. It's basically just picking up the vibrations in the air, and then like super amplifying them. That's why they're so near field. They don't pick up any background noise. Like you have right. bombs going off behind you and shit. It doesn't pick it up. That's why they use them in studios. Um, this one right here, I believe, is a powered condenser mic. Um, Same. And then uh, what's the other class? There's there's one more class that's also phantom powered. Uh, I, oh, and ribbons. Ribbons are like old school, though. I don't see a lot of ribbon mics anymore. <laughs> That's fun. So dynamic um, condensers and ribbon. I thought there was another one, though. I thought there were... Or am I missing a fourth? Although ribbon mics do sound cool. They sound really warm and like old-timey. But, uh, yeah. Um, and, and again, at that point, you'll need... Uh, once you jump, make that jump... Um, yeah. Oh, are what's my mic? This is a Rode NT1. Yeah. The, the cardioid is the pickup pattern like the so like this like my mic is set to cardioid mode and so like you can tell as I rotate this my voice will get super weird because the pattern. holy shit that thing's directional yeah yeah it's super it, it's very which is really good dude it's yours good. is even more directional than mine like I can I can come around it and you can still hear it my pickup pattern's nowhere near that narrow 
that's part of why this is in yeah. picking up a lot of verb and stuff from the wall. And dude, that's like garage. perfect for your environment. Yeah, this is, I'm, dude, I can't tell you how grateful I am. This is, this has really made things different. Um, but, and there's a, there is a switch on here so that it can do. There's there two of them. A, I think you also have a low pass filter on it too. Uh, there is. Yeah. Which I, th I couldn't, I can't, I can't tell which is on and which is off. So and actually, actually, no, I don't think it's low pass. I think it's got a gain. I think it's like a, pl uh, a plus 10 dB gain. So Something like, like if, if you have it connected into an amplifier and you're just not getting enough volume out of it, you can clip that on. It just makes it more sensitive. So, um, where was I going with that? Man, people oh, are that's blowing cool. our shit up. Cardioid is the pickup pattern. Yeah. It, it'll show like a little, like, partial circle sort of thing, and it shows you like, like I said, this is this is if you were to draw out how you can pick me up. I cannot believe yeah, the off-axis rejection of that thing. It's I, I don't remember it being that good. That's crazy. Because mine, I can just be like, hey guys, how's it going? And you can still perfectly hear me. It just takes the it just bit. takes the fidelity out of my voice and I can get far away and I can get up close to it like this and it's like this this one's much more suited to picking up like you know a lot of people whereas that yeah. thing's just what's that <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy that, but but you can flip a switch on yours and it, it actually opens up the other side too so that yeah, you can have two people talking from yeah across the table that's that's what made that mic that's the AT2050 that he has it's basically an it's similar to an AT2020 except for it has multiple pickup patterns uh-huh so and and I think it sounds I think it sounds warmer. Like the AT twenty twenty to me didn't sound as warm as the AT twenty fifty. Oh wow, oh, we got uh, a lot of people that just dropped support here. Uh, Syntexify, thank you for the five pounds. Yep. He said, "Thanks for the comedy." Enough said. You are very oh. welcome, sir. Yeah. Shick and Ants, thank you for the two dollars and all the support during the stream. You've been amazing. I said I sent you my info on Twitter for my T shirt. I will check it out and we will make sure that damn thing gets to you, sir. Uh, Ice Ever, thank you for the five euros. Is that the euros, the little e? I think it is, euros. Yep. Yep. He said, hi, I still run my creative sound blaster card on my PC because my X99 can't run my headphones. Hi from Lithuania. See, and that's a perfect mm -hmm. excuse to have like a better sound card. Like if you need to drive headphones and stuff like that, usually onboard sound, sound it doesn't drive headphones very well, but even the new motherboards that come out, they can. Yeah. Like I've, see, I've seen some of the sound cards that are integrated in these motherboards that can drive 600 ohms, like no problem. Yeah. So mine. When I plug my headphones into mine, um, it, it pops up and says, oh, you've plugged headphones in. And then it goes, oh, hey, the impedance on, on this is really high, so we're going to boost your stuff to maximum or whatever. So, yeah. And again, I don't know what the deal is. I've plugged my – so I've got these DT770s, the 250 ohm version. Yep. I've plugged these into my cell phone and had no problem with volume. Like they're – I don't – like, uh, you know, I thought, oh, man, I'm going to need some kind of special thing to boost the power on these or whatever. And it's like, no, I don't I don't know what the deal is, but it works. These are great. That's crazy, dude. Like 250 ohms is pretty heavy duty. So I know I plug in my 600 yeah. ohm headphones into the iPhone and at 100 percent volume. It's like it's like regular headphones at one percent volume. Like they yeah, so I, I, maybe maybe it's a maybe it's like a logarithmic curve or something like that. Um. Yeah. Uh, Rene said, I'm pretty happy with my Marantz Professional Pod Pack 1 USB mic. Just as good as the USB mic where you you were running at one point and only 50 bucks. Oh, well, that's cheap. Yeah, that's definitely cheaper than the USB pluggable Vox. Like, if you guys are looking for... That that was the mic that I liked um, when I was traveling. So so back now, now I use a Razer. I use the Razer microphone because it's actually a really good microphone. It's just super, they're super expensive. Though. They're like 200 bucks for like a microphone. I'm like, come on, for a USB mic. Um, they do yeah. sound good, though. Uh... I used before that I had a USB pluggable Vox, which was a seventy dollar. Uh, looked it looked like an Audio Technica AT twenty twenty knockoff. Like for, if you didn't see the label on it, you'd swear it was a knockoff, and it sounded just like the Audio Technica AT twenty twenty. But it plugged in via USB, and that's what cool. I used for my audio. Whenever when I was when I was at Maker Fairs and I did live streams at Maker Fairs from like the hotel room and stuff, that was always the microphone that I used, and that thing got a lot of mileage. It always worked great, and I want to say it was about seventy bucks. It's called it's it's in my Amazon store if you guys want to go look at it. But uh, it definitely sounded better than a than a Yeti Snowball. And uh, for 70 bucks with the USB interface and everything, it was like cost effective for a lot of people. So that was the one that I recommended personally, even though it was a no name. And the company used to laugh because I'd always say that it sounded exactly because I'd plug them in side by side. It sounded exactly like an Audio Technica AT2020 with no EQ added. Wow. Like, like exactly. And they'd always laugh because they're like, no, we swear we didn't copy it. It's bullshit. You guys copied it exactly. I can even like look through the I, I, I can look through the mesh and I can see the freaking like pickup. It's the it's the exact same one. I guarantee you if I took them took them apart, it would be the same damn pickup. 
Am I going to stream on Twitch after this? Unfortunately, no. Today, today I'm going to take... I only slept for, like, less than three hours last night, so I'm going to go take a nap after this. Um, you, I think we're about ready to wrap up, though. We try to keep it at three hours. We're four minutes over. We want to thank everybody today for the amazing show and turning out. We want to thank you for all those super chats. You guys are fucking awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, we share those. As a matter of fact, I still... I owe you a payment, sir. I will, I will get that out to you. Something. Where's my money? I know he's going to come over. Where's my money, bitch? Banging on my door. <laughs> calling the police. Um, we do share those super chats, so thank you guys so much for all the support. That's how we fund these, since they usually get demonetized, because we end up saying a bunch of shit that YouTube yeah. doesn't like. So, you know, yeah. fuck them. We do what we want. We do what we want. Hey, NFG Nader, thank you for that last five bucks, man. I really do appreciate it. You guys have been wonderful, and we will see you uh, next week. Same bad time, same bad place, 10 a.m., and hopefully next week we won't have this audio ducking problem. Yeah, I think we'll get this figured out. I think we'll get it figured out. But Zoom is otherwise Zoom seems like it's working pretty well. So, great, yeah. so yeah. And uh, hopefully by next week I'll have a couple of other little things configured that might be kind of cool. So uh, if you guys want to keep following us, uh, we also stream over on Twitch during the week. So check us out in the video description. You'll find links to all of our social media and our Twitches. Make sure you're following so you get a notification yeah. when we go live over there. And uh, make sure you're following us on social media too because we're both we're both quite the tweeters. So yeah, if, if sure. yeah, so come come on over to the Twitter and tag us and some stuff. You got some questions, want to say stuff, or even just share pictures of your PCs and stuff like that. Yeah. Love to see it. And we're both like needlessly addicted to the internet. So we will see you guys next week. I'm gonna go take a nap. All right, <laughs> all right. Let's give them all a wave. See you guys over on the social medias or on the Twitch. And until next time, end stream, end button, pushing end, pushing another thing, pushing end. Again.